energy sectors present important opportunities to create jobs and benefit the environment. One of the impediments to growing the circular economy is knowledge and access to waste, industrial bioproducts and stock fee. To overcome this, Council and uh, the team uh, across the region will be introducing tools that support the resource uh, exchange to help create new local economic uh, value. The vision is that by 2030, the circular economy principles will uh, not just be a dream, they will actually be a matter of course and normalisation across this community and for others to, to look at and see the great things that are happening. I think the other part about that is going to be the importance how we break the silos in relation to the opportunities for waste and the circular economy. Besides seeing things sit there for, for loss of energy and time, so we can actually benefit, create other products and be connected. So there's the, the advantages of the circular economy, but it's the relationships which we will build across this region. And that's the thing that makes us so strong, that humanity of relationships of coming together. Trust, whoa, imagine that word, you know, and being able to share. Bundaberg already does that in bucket loads. We have a, a unique identity, mainly coming from our agricultural side, where we couldn't go up the road to get a spanner or something else. We have to be inventive and we have to be, uh, be able to think outside the square and work with our neighbours to get things done. So you're in a place uh, where... We like to share. Actually, we got voted most caring community in Australia uh, recently this year, and we're not an affluent community, so there's some secrets out there. So Council uh, certainly has been working with Utilitas to establish the biohub in the Bundaberg region, which will produce biohydrogen. This, is not, this not only opens the doors to an entirely new and sustainable industry, it contributes to the bioeconomy. Organic waste from local farms used for uh, clean bioenergy through this facility. And suddenly, agricultural products become a commodity, not just a burden on our farmers and the wider community. The future is certainly looking greener, certainly with sugarcane tops, sweet potatoes, potentially fueling hydrogen vehicles and others. Uh, certainly at this event, you'll hear uh, in more detail from uh, Council uh, uh, Executive Officer Ben Ardup about what Council is doing to support hydrogen industry uh, and uh, the Bundaberg region. We're certainly proud. We're one of the major sponsors for the National Bio Conference uh, held recently in Sydney, and uh, it just, it's just about getting on and doing things. So it's just one of the ways that Council is just demonstrating our commitment to best practice and sustainability. Uh, you will have the opportunity to actually visit a number of other businesses that I see here across all the tables here and across the region that are already contributing and have been contributing for decades to the circular economy. These examples are uh, just the tip of the iceberg, punting, no punts included, when it comes to uh, developing the Bundaberg region's uh, economy. Unfortunately, there certainly is a perception in our capitals and the interstate that regional Queensland opposes net zero and denies the reality of climate change. That perception is a creation of some certainly opportuni opportunist politicians and others, and it doesn't actually reflect the reality of what is actually happening on the ground. As far as I'm concerned, the Bundaberg region is a leader promoting and developing green energy and biomanufacturing. Bio Bundaberg, as I said there before, whether it be bioenergy, biofuel, biomanufacturing, biomedical, bioresearch, it is bio by its nature. So Bundaberg is the Goldilocks region, not too big, not too small, but just right for biotechnology and big data initiatives. So uh, I know that uh, everyone here today are equally committed to achieving those same goals. And it's really important to then continue to spread the word, to be positive. And uh, there's many here from, uh, from Bioscience Group and, and other stakeholders who have been pushing this message year on year. And we see particularly from not just from the other uh, the biofuels and bio industries and, and bio waste, but uh, particularly we see for biomedical and bio research. We have a new hospital on track, which is close to a billion dollars. We have large manufacturing opening here, over half a billion dollars, uh, roughly, in projects coming forward uh, that uh, are actually starting to actually come off of the actual paper and into reality. So the economies of scale gives us a place <coughs> like no other, you know, from 
the oceans and the golden sands and white sands to the hinterlands, the rivers, the patchwork quilt of fields in between. Our greatest strength is our people and our diversity. So if there's ever a place to be able then to be connected, as we say, the returning people that we now have coming from overseas to Australia that are certainly sending up prices of houses, but also, you know, our interstate migration really puts Bundaberg in a strategically uh, good place. D up the road from three and a half million people, but also uh, connected in a way that we share and we embrace each other. So thank you for your attendance and I uh, hope through the networking you get, even if you get one good idea, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, Bundaberg certainly isn't going to uh, sit back and wait for things to happen and you'll see that in a few of the presentations today. So thank you very much and as I say, like the turtles, keep coming back. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jack Dempsey. And you can see why so many great things are happening when we have such a passionate leader as our Mayor. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the event partners who have made this event possible. Bundaberg Regional Council, Fraser Coast Regional Council, Gympie Regional Council, and Bundaberg Department of State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Their partnership has been integral in making this event happen. Please join me in a round of applause for the event partners. <laughs> uh, firstly, some housekeeping. Uh, for those in the room, toilets are to the right as you walk out of this room. And in the case of an evacuation, you can access the assembly area by exiting the front doors and moving over the zebra crossing to the grassed area. If you can please put your phones on silent. Um, of course, everyone checked in with the um, COVID check-in at the front door. If you haven't done that for some reason, please go and do that. And has everyone got a Melbourne, <laughs> Melbourne Cup sweep ticket? That's the most important thing. If you haven't got one from the girls yet, please do that. We're going to be watching the, the race at two o'clock and uh, we've got some fantastic goodies for the first place um, winners. So uh, please make sure you're part of that. We'd also like to inform you that Bundaberg Regional Council will be taking photographs and videos throughout this event, as well as live streaming for those who are attending virtually. Your image may be used to be published on social media. If you do not wish for your image to be recorded, or if you have any concerns, please speak to a Bundaberg Regional Council team member, particularly Kate over there, put your hand up, Kate, <laughs> and Emily, who was, uh, who was running around, if you have any concerns about your image being um, published. Uh, we're going to be using Slido Q&A and polling platform for you to ask questions at the panel later today. Has anyone used Slido before? Fantastic, thank you, Deb. So to download it, simply go to www.slido.com and enter the code hashtag BundyBio2021. So that's capital B's in Bundy and Bio 2021. And uh, later on, you'll be able to ask questions for the panel. And we're going to be having a fun little poll tomorrow morning as you enter. So please make sure you download slido.com. Also, if you are taking photos or posting about the conference, we'd love you to use the hashtag BundyBio21, using uh, the mayor's lead there, BundyBio21. Um, so please use that when you're using, um, doing any posts. We'd uh, really love to be able to capture them all. So, let's get started. We uh, have an action-packed two days and we're going to start off in really fantastic style with Professor Ian McKinnon. Professor Ian McKinnon is Director of the Centre for Clean Energy Technologies and Practices at QUT. He's the founder and former Executive Director of the Institute for Former in Future Environments at QUT. Prior to these roles, Ian was Executive Director at the Australian Research Council responsible for driving collaboration between universities and industry. Professor McKinnon is a member of the Ministerial Energy Council and of the Hydrogen Task Force for the Queensland Government. He has held appointments at Arizona State University, NASA Johnson Space Centre, the University of New Mexico in the USA and at the University of Queensland. Professor McKinnon is co-lead in the Hydrogen Exports and Value Chains Research and Development Program 
the Future Energy Exports CRC. Please welcome Professor Ian McKinnon. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jack, for a great start. Um, as always, very much on target, and uh, not afraid to hold reasonable views and sensible views about our country and our regions. <coughs> I think you're a born leader. And part of this today, or at least what I'm going to be talking about, is about vision and leadership and doing. <coughs> and why it's a pleasure to be here to be talking about those things in this community because I think you understand that. <coughs> so I'll be speaking mostly about very important things, but the first one, excuse me a moment, I just need to see what I'm looking, what I'm, what I'm presenting. <laughs> very important commodities, energy, water and food. There's a nexus of these. That nexus has been around for thousands of years. And indeed, all species, humans as well as non-humans, depend upon those three commodities. They overlap, and many of you are probably less aware than others that the energy and water nexus is just as important as the water and food nexus and energy as well. And of course, in the background there, you see a very interesting graph which goes from you know, pre-Stone Age through to about now, 2000. And in the year 2000, we had about 7.8 billion. No, about 7 billion people. Now we have about 7.8 billion people. And that trend, that exponential trend going straight up to the roof is planned, is continuing. And it will sort of flatten out around about 2045, 2050, roughly about that period when we expect to have around about 9 billion, could be a little bit less, could be a bit more, but it'll start to flatten out and drop off, assuming the population trends continue as they do right now, and even with COVID and the, the deaths that have come from that. So these are critical things, and the context is really important because this is actually what we're talking about. On the global scene, and if there's lots that you'll hear about this week and in the weeks leading up to this week, um, the uh, International Energy Agency rarely does roadmaps. In fact, I think it's probably the first one that's done. Because the IEA is really a data collector and an analyzer and just simply provides the, the, the community, the world community, with information about energy. Well, what you can see here is that they've started to put together a roadmap. And it's very rare for the uh, IEA to do that. But it's predominantly about how we can get to this net zero. They're not saying it's easy. And in fact, they're saying there's a very narrow window. And there are some very important things to do in order to achieve that. One of them, where you see the arrow, is that the expectation is that from next year on, there'll be a net addition of in the order of 900, maybe 1,000 gigawatts of renewable energy per year till 2030 in order to meet that net zero um, target. Last year, we added 275 gigawatts only around the world. So we have to take a three to four times increase in renewable energy around the world in order to meet that target, the target being to reduce the emissions required. Now, the argument is it can be done, and I won't be talking a lot about all the detail of this, but I'll be putting it into some context for you, because what you're doing here in Bundaberg is very much complementary to the rest of what's being talked about in the energy industry. So the energy industry is undergoing a transformation whether we like it or not, and we need to be able to be prepared for that and to go with it. In the Australian scene, um, this is a report that came out earlier this year. I actually like this report is because it's one of the few, one of the few that talks about the Australian market in this area of changing energy. Uh, I 
wish I could actually point to it, but you'll see here, most of the conversation was about, about that track there. Um, maybe if I don't have an arrow, sorry. About exports. This is the first report I've seen, and let me assure you, there's at least 50 to 75 over the past three or four years, highly credible reports about energy, the transition, etc., from all around the world. This is one of the few that's in Australia, by Australians, talking about the Australian market. Most of the time, the conversation in Australia is about renewable energy, generating hydrogen, going to export, and that's fantastic, and we would like to see that. Very few of these reports talk about the rest of the market, which is the domestic market. And the predominant one for hydrogen in Australia is initially transport, but also many other industries, including also additional power capabilities. And this report also indicates that there are already economically viable industries or practices that could use um, clean energy or hydrogen, for example, biohydrogen or hydrogen of either sort. Remote power, vehicles, uh, back to base capability, particularly in transport, and materials handling. What does the natural gas value chain look like? We know this value chain. Um, we see it in Queensland. Um, the reason for putting this up is we don't quite often remember that it's actually power to gas, storage or distribution, gas to power, and then use. And in Australia, we have a very strong natural gas industry. We have 22 LNG trains. Those are the ones that liquefy the natural gas. Uh, three of them in Queensland, one in Northern Territory, the rest in West Australia. And we have a little bit of that gas coming off in the transmission side to our households and through pipelines, etc. So when we look at economic analyses, quite often particularly with regard to these new industries, our economists focus on just that power to gas and then delivery of the gas. Let's see what the equivalent would be in the hydrogen gas industry. Not a lot different, really. The energy generation is different. The consideration at the front end is now about location and land use. The renewable energy, as we know, there's many different types of renewable energy. I'll just put a few up there, and we're very good at that. But also note that there's electrolysis, and down the other end, there's a thing called a fuel cell. And we could equally take off at the distribution point gas that can deliver to buses and trucks. We can also generate electrons through that fuel cell to power other electric capability. So it's again, same thing, power to gas, storage distribution, gas to power, and then use. We can also use turbines, but at the moment, the turbine use at capacity, so for example, the equivalent to the Cogan Creek turbines, is not yet there, but people are certainly working on it. And I'm, I haven't talked about biogas and biofuel here because I know you'll learn a lot more about that from other people than, than from me, but there is this important capability here to integrate and, and put compatible capabilities in place within regions to deliver your own regional capability in power and power use. And <coughs> um, more importantly, to look at how you can deliver capability and build a domestic market. So rather than focus just on an export market, we need to also build a domestic market. Now, um, so what's fancy about, what's, what's new about fuel cells, you'll say? Gosh, they were on uh, Apollo missions a long time ago, before most of you were born. Not me, but before most of you were born. We'll get to that in a moment. And I'll talk a little bit about electrolysis first and then talk also about fuel cells and what's the difference, what's happened now that's made this all of a sudden come to people's attention globally. But first, what about this thing called fuel cells and batteries? Well, both of them are just simply converting chemical energy to electrical energy or electrical energy to chemical energy. We know about batteries, there's lots of them. You just put 
a voltage across there or connect up the cathode and the anode and you've got electrons flowing through. A fuel cell is not a lot different. You're taking two products or two components, you're putting them across a catalyst, a chemical reaction, and you end up with electrons and the waste or the exhaust is water. The obverse of that is electrolysis. So in a sense, we can't be talking about a domestic market or even an export market with just electrolysis as the focus without talking about fuel cells as well. You've got to have both in the equation. So if you're manufacturing, and there's been some fantastic uh, announcements recently about building manufacturing capacity in electrolysis, we also need to have building uh, to build manufacturing capacity in fuel cells. And there are many different types of fuel cells um, and I won't go through all of them, but each of them have different capacities and capabilities uh, and they uh, depend upon the environment in which you are, the local environment. <coughs> now, you've also heard <coughs> lots of discussion about the advantages that Australia has. These are classic examples of the advantages. Uh, I'll take Japan as one example. Not a lot of landmass in Japan, many people. Uh, a lot of landmass in Australia, not many people, lots of sunshine in Australia. And you see the little arrow down there at the bottom of that scale. That arrow is the maximum uh, sunlight or DNI for Japan. And you can see where it sits in Australia. It's about, at best, it's Melbourne, you know, and occasionally maybe one or two days a year because we don't get a lot of uh, good weather down in Melbourne. So there's a big difference between the two countries. <coughs> But I mentioned earlier, and of course the population densities are different, so the energy demand is also different. That's why people are talking about export, because the Japanese thought about this 20 or more years ago, became even more obvious when Fukushima occurred and have put in place strategic plans, something that we're a little bit short of in Australia. <coughs> so about these fuel cells, what happened? What's made the difference? Well, it's fairly straightforward. If you look at this plot, this is a plot of the patents awarded in the period 2005 to 2009, I think it is, just four years, 40,000 patents in fuel cells alone. Who held most of them? Japan. The rest, the next, Korea. And what did they do? Yes, we had fuel cells on Apollo, but making a fuel cell work on Apollo in that environment is different to putting a fuel cell into a vehicle that's used for the consumer market or different for putting a fuel cell out into stationary uses somewhere in a, in a remote community. <coughs> so a lot of work had to be done to get those fuel cell technologies, the concept, to the point where it's commercially viable. That was one big change. And in that period, actually a 10-year period, over that spreading uh, before and after that, Japan spent as much and more money, in fact, on R&D, gets back to Jack's point about R&D, than the US and Europe combined in fuel cells alone. So hell, who's got the market in fuel cells? Japan. Now, they've also been very generous to the world and allowed for five years royalty-free use of their patents. And that's just closed at the end of 2020. So now the market's getting hot. Beginning to see the here, the issues here. This has changed the way we think about the utilisation of things like hydrogen and other fuels that go into fuel cells. Let's look at electrolysis. This is a very busy slide, so I won't focus on too much of it. But if you look down there under future, the IEA has projected that by 2030, if I can read that correctly, um, yep, uh, 8, 8 million tonnes of hydrogen is, is required to meet a target that they talked about as the net zero target by 2030 to get to 2050. So that's around about 160 gigalitres of water per year. <coughs> now, stoichiometrically, you can work out 9 kilograms of water gives you 1 kilogram of hydrogen and 8 kilograms of oxygen. Let's assume there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system which we do, make it 20 kilos, etc., And you end up with a pretty reasonable estimate of how much water is required to do electrolysis to generate those 8 million tonnes, for example, for global use. 
And on the next slide, I'll show you what we could do for Australia or for Queensland. Also, take into account that not everyone has made gigawatt electrolyzers up till now. In fact, nobody has. They've made capacity to manufacture at gigawatt manufacturing capacity modules of 10 and 20 megawatts, and, and some of them are smaller in 2 megawatt modules. So be aware of what the industry is saying and doing. <coughs> And you'll notice there are different sizes of electrolyzers there. So if we go to Australia and look at how much water is needed, what I've got there is a range. <coughs> In the top there, that, that little circular diagram shows you how much <coughs> water is, has, was abstracted in Australia for basically uh, agricultural use, industrial use and urban use. Um, in the one, period, one year, 2018-19, which was the driest year in Australia over the whole country uh, for 50 years. <coughs> and I've taken some estimates of what the export and domestic market might be by 2030 and 2050. You can see it up there under Australia and under global. Uh, the 5,500 gigalitres per year is required by 2050 to meet net zero um, uh, emissions. 12% of the current water use by the energy industry. Okay, so that puts some of those things into perspective. Now, could you do that locally? Could you build a domestic market in Queensland or Australia? Well, we've got over a thousand wa wastewater treatment plants. That's all those black dots there on the map of Australia. And you can see that we have about 240 or 250 wastewater treatment plants in Queensland, but we only recycle 7% of that water, mostly the golf courses one or two schools down south in, in the Queen's Brisbane area. And one of our friends in state development just recently did a quick survey of the 19 local councils and 95% of wastewater connections. And you can see here the potential recyclable water is 308 gigalitres per year. Even if you took half of that uh, recycled water and put it into electrolysis, you could be fueling 16,000 buses a year. Now there are 16,000 registered diesel buses in Queensland. Now, I don't know whether they're all on the road at once or whether they even drive, but it tells you that there's a possibility to build a domestic market locally within regions, not just in one capital city in Queensland. Notwithstanding the fact that desalination plants were put in all around Australia over the past 10 or 20 years, and in that same drought year, what is it? Mm, there was 350 gigalitres unused, wasted capital, just sitting there. So a bit of strategic planning by all of our communities would actually build the domestic market very quickly. I'm off my political platform now. So electrolysis, very quickly, just wanted to point out that there is a couple of these, and but more importantly, to look at the efficiency levels that are up there ranging from 60% to 80-odd percent, and those efficiency levels will improve over time. So this is, these are now, the, the first two on the left are considered low efficiency by this, uh, this industry, but they are well and truly in the, in the commercial market, and the others are coming along stream. We've just put in an ADM just recently at Redlands. Um, but on the right, the last one on the right is another one, interesting because it operates at different temperature conditions, so it operates at higher temperature, so if you're looking for um, waste heat uses, uses or additional use of waste heat, you could put in a solid oxide electrolyzer. But it also can take CO2 and produce syngas. And now some of you know, who work in the bio world, syngas is also a very valuable commodity for developing new products. On the fuel cell side, gas to power, we have, again, similar choices. Look at the efficiencies getting up there higher, looking at the gas to power equivalent in other industries, you can see that the efficiencies for these fuel cell technologies are already quite high and will continue to grow uh, to, to a higher level. Uh, I think 80% is a normal expectation in the future. And I just mentioned down there a couple of others, molten carbonate fuel cells are about the only ones that are at megawatt scale as well as some of these. Um, so again, if you are looking at uh, waste heat, other types of gas mixtures, you can use other types of fuel cells. In other words, if you're generating, let's say you're combusting something, 
and you've got still got CO2 sitting around, a bit of water, you could make syngas. And those are methods that you can use and integrate with your existing bio-industries. Finally, a couple of quick words about what we're doing uh, at QUT. We, we've had this project going for quite a while now. It's to build a um, what we call a plug-and-play flexible pilot plant, where we've got a couple of different types of photovoltaic, so concentrated photovoltaic, standard rooftop photovoltaic, um, a couple of different types of batteries, a couple of different types of electrolyzers, and a couple of other things like fuel cells and so on to close the circuit. Uh, particularly important would be putting together the microgrid that allowed flexibility of use of these things, because there's no point in putting a pilot plant in if you're just going to operate it one way. You need to operate pilot plants many different ways, as Fiona will know, <laughs> in order to find out what's the best way to operate these things. And that concept we found when we put this in place and started to talk to people in the industry, because most of us are just not power engineers or electrical engineers, more fool us, we thought you could do this. Well, actually, it's not that easy to get electrical engineers to think innovatively. Remember the title was something about making, maintaining the innovation? So we're actually gradually changing the power industry to, to understand that, yes, you can do this, you can think about designing things so that you've got variable uh, capability, um, and that's what we're doing right now. Um, I'll show you this next photo because, again, because we're a flexible lot, um, that's what you see there on the right in that photo is a, is a refueling station um, put in place in a hurry. Young Michelle up there put it in place in three weeks. Uh, we were asked to put it in place because uh, somehow or other there'd been these fuel cell vehicles delivered to Queensland and, oh, there was nowhere to refuel them. So... Uh, <laughs> So um, because we'd already got the site set and we'd already done a lot of HAZOPs, et cetera, it was a good place to go because essentially it was a much quicker way to put that in place rather than starting from scratch. So a local company um, based on the Sunshine Coast <coughs> provided a, a, a small, what you call a, a baby refueler. It's not really a commercial refueler. It takes about an hour or so to refuel at Hyundai, so you, know, you need a coffee shop right next door. Um, but uh, a commercial one will do it in five minutes. This, this takes a while, but that was the, the, the best basis we could do, and so it's operating right now and working quite well. <coughs> um, last thing I wanted to point out about what some of the research we've been doing is that the thinking around that pilot plant generated by making a plug-and-play or flexible pilot plant to operate <coughs> a range of different components from different vendors and uh, parts of the community to make them operate well and also recognising one other very important fact. <coughs> this is why regions are very important. Um, and I've said this a couple of times now, and it's got me in a bit of trouble. Uh, you can't exactly put a wind farm down in George Street. Uh, you can't really put a solar farm at a Jindalee or an Indrapilly. But we do know in Jindalee and Indrapilly and in other parts of urban areas, including small towns of 10, 20,000 people, they've got lots of rooftop solar. So the idea here is to recruit that rooftop solar, bring it together, essentially, to what we call uh, an adaptive renewable energy plant, put it together with generating hydrogen, storing it in batteries. Remember, batteries and hydrogen, they're just storage media. And then putting them all together to allow refueling stations in a local neighbourhood. You could do this in remote communities, you could do it in Bundaberg, in a number of different areas. Um, and essentially, you can then model the growth of that need and demand as you go, because you do this in a modular fashion. There's no need to build a gigawatt refueling station because you don't have the demand. You might have the demand for, you know, a megawatt. And that way, that way you can actually design and predict what your needs are going to be and handle the, ca the capital costs as you go and build this into local communities. So that's one concept. Uh, and there are a couple of others that are floating around related to other um, utilization of, for example, what I've mentioned before, wastewater in, in other parts. And I think you'll hear about that later on today. Now, to finish up, I just want to point out that the regions are the place because really it's the home of invention and ingenuity. And a few of you in the audience will know that Queensland, particularly up and down the coast of Queensland, has been a place where there's been many, many efforts.
efforts to put in place uh, mechanical harvesters. Uh, and this is one example on the left. And indeed, I think Brandenburg is still the center of uh, global m um, machine harvest. Uh, is that correct? Harvesters? Yes. Um, there's a wonderful video on this um, by um, Oztoft. Uh, the Toft brothers, I think, were the ones here in Brandenburg. Yes. So that's a good one. Now, on the right, of course, another regional icon, Qantas. And you probably can't see the fine print there on that plane there. But that fine print is for a young guy who we probably know, Bert. The photo down there, you all know this photo, is Bert Hinkler. Uh, 1911, 1912, that's him with an ironing board on his glider, testing out flight yeah, in Mon Ripper, yeah. That sort of stuff happens in regions. And there's many other regions in Australia where invention and ingenuity is the key to the way that we've developed over the past many, many decades. <coughs> I encourage you to continue in that tradition. Finally, what's the future? Just taking the idea of flight, okay. Flight is now, air, uh, the aerospace industry is now very, very seriously looking at using um, fuel cells or synfuel, many other types of uh, low carbon me methods to generate electric flight, basically. <coughs> And that graph there gives you the reasons why, and the one down the bottom is, is fuel cells, the one at the top is uh, synfuels, which you can make as well from bio products. Um, because, like pioneers, they started a long time ago. Ten years ago, they were doing this. Is a, this is a plot of what they've been doing in Europe. Um, started in 2010 with batteries. I think they've moved off batteries ex for light airplanes. Uh, there was a battery-powered plane that was first flown in Australia in July or June this year in South Australia. So it's coming. Bundaberg might have an airport that would have some light airplanes soon with batteries. But ultimately, where it's going is, this is an Airbus photo taken off the web, um, going this way. So the future will en encompass all of these modes of transport and many other industries as well, and you know of those ones in Gladstone where this is uh, very much a part of the story for Gladstone. Finally, I'd like to finish with this little slide because <coughs> when that photo was taken, uh, we only had about three and a half billion people on the planet. But it was an important image because this is called Earthrise. It's as um, Bill Anders was coming around the moon and his craft. Um, we did that with technology that you would consider barely even getting up out of bed for today. So what's the future? But the importance of this image is that it showed the world that we're just one planet and we need energy, food and water. And we better find better ways to distribute it, more efficient and effective ways to use it and generate it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Ian McKinnon. We have a gift for you. Very sustainable, of course, which, of course, this whole conference is. You'll notice you didn't get a printed conference pack. It's all online. We didn't even uh, actually print name tags for you. That was a conscious choice. And now you actually have to network with each other to find out your names. So, um, But thank you so much. What an inspiring way to start our conference today. Our next presenter is Simon Shaw, Managing Director of the Hydrogen Collective. Simon has a passion for renewable energy projects that support community and economic development. As a business, H2C assess capability and enable projects that integrate renewable energy into regions and businesses with a focus on green hydrogen, which I know you're going to be hearing a lot of in the next two days. The basis of these projects is the enablement of producing and using renewable energy within a local area or region to retain energy capital. 
H2C are building local renewable energy projects in Queensland, New South Wales, Western Australia and New Zealand as a result of the economic, environmental and commercial impact to local businesses and councils. It is these projects that assist in the development of local bioeconomies. Please welcome Simon Shaw. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the welcome. I always get a little bit nervous following Professor McKinnon uh, in these uh, presentations because I'm hoping that what I'm going to present uh, can tie in and, and really follow on from that because the auspicious professor is, is such a legend in the field. And so as you were going through the, uh, the presentation there, Ian, I was quite thankful uh, to understand that a lot of what we're going to talk about here in this presentation, uh, which is focused on how the local communities uh, and how the businesses integrate more renewable energy into their regions really ties in and follows on from that message. So I was breathing a sigh of relief there uh, for a few seconds when that information was coming out. Uh, and so this presentation, the discussions that I've been fortunate uh, enough to have with council here in Bundaberg, uh, with, with the mayor and with Ben and with Emily and the team, um, is really focusing on a few different things. But essentially it is how can a local region access their own renewable energy and use their own renewable energy? So to help add to that conversation, uh, with bioenergy being a critical component to that, today's discussion is going to be about, okay, let's have a quick look at the traditional approach to how energy is produced and distributed and how you as residents and businesses in the local area are part of that energy market, step one. Step two, is being able to say, okay, if we were to shift that, what's the local approach? What does that look like? What are some of the current mechanisms uh, that regions and communities and businesses are using to access local renewable energy? And finally, how can local, re uh, local communities retain energy capital and some opportunities uh, that are here in the local region? So what you'll see here on this slide is the traditional approach to accessing energy. And by energy, we mean electricity, petrol, diesel, and gas. We all use most of those different energy forms almost on a daily basis. So over on the left-hand side, you have your coal-fired power stations, you have um, your um, imported oil for petrol and diesel use, you have your on and offshore gas field where we get our supply of gas. Everyone knows it's pretty stock standard. Okay. That energy is then bought by a retailer, and that retailer then distributes it to you, where you consume it, in your car, in your home, in your business, wherever that might be. It's relatively simple to understand. If I can ask a question and maybe indicate by a show of hands, how many people in the room can tell me, or at least acknowledge that they know, what their average price per kilowatt hour of electricity is on their energy bill? Anyone? We've got about 70 people in the room. There's about 10 hands up. Okay. Interesting start. So did you know 40% of your energy bill goes to the production of energy? So let's just say you spend $200 a month. 40% of your energy bill goes to those people and those businesses on the left-hand side to produce your energy. 60% of your energy bill goes to retailers and distributors. So the people who buy the energy off those producers put the gas reticulation projects in, they manage the poles and wires to distribute that energy. 60% of your bill goes to those businesses to get that energy into your business, into your home, into your car, wherever that might be. So understanding the existing and traditional approach to how energy is produced distributed and you consume it is the first step in better understanding how we can create, produce and use our own local renewable energy. This slide that you see here represents a shift in thinking because what this slide describes is how locals can access renewable energy that is produced in the local area. Now the reason there is a shift in thinking here 
is because it's going to require consumers to consider how they consume energy. So let's put this in a context. In the left-hand side in the middle, you'll see electric fuel cell, electric hybrid vehicles replacing internal combustion engines and vehicles. That takes a big shift. If we are to shift the use of the 96% of petrol and diesel products that are consumed in Australia at the moment to local renewable energy electricity for use in electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, we need to shift the way that we're consuming the energy. How many people in the room have an electric car? One. Let, let's, let's say electric or electric hybrid. Okay, we've gone from one to four. <laughs> but I think that really shows the shift in thinking that we need to understand. If you want to support local renewable energy production, we need to make conscious decisions in the way that we consume this energy. Transportation, as Ian said before, is one of the initial early movers in the green hydrogen industry. So who's going to make green hydrogen if no one's going to buy it? Sometimes it's as simple as that. So what this slide here shows is a change in the way of thinking for local communities and how they consume energy. And that is existing predominantly fossil fuel energy, electricity, petrol, diesel and gas. How do you shift that to what you see on the left hand side? In the middle is the distribution. It's one thing to make it. And as Ian was pointing out, the technology advancements in the production of renewable energy are becoming more efficient on a daily basis. So we know that's going to stack up. The distribution of that energy and consuming that energy at the back end for your homes, your businesses, your vehicles, is where there needs to be a lot of consideration. And you see in the middle there, local, um, local smart grids and microgrids uh, are a way to distribute this local renewable energy. We can also see in there embedded green gas networks, whether that's from tube trailers uh, or bullets being distributed around a local community, or even reticulated gas networks that are either blended uh, or 100% green gas. That's another way. And of course, as Ian was saying, and how the solar market has uh, been able to integrate into the market is by household and business rooftop solar. There weren't big solar farms before there was an enormous amount of capacity on household rooftop solar. That's what led the market. And of course, that distributes that local energy to you as a house, as a business, as a manufacturing plant, as a public transport operator. You can see how this is a change in the way of thinking. And it's moving away from what we have traditionally done with our energy, purchase it from a national grid, purchase it from a large gas reticulation network. It's shifting that away. It's being able to take back a little bit of control. Challenges. <laughs> There's quite a few, so I've tried to keep it to four. But you can see up here, based on what we've been able to discuss with different businesses and different levels of government, some of the key industry challenges to making and using renewable energy in the local area. Number one, accessing information. How do I do it? <laughs> There's very limited information in the market that is customised to a specific business or a resident or council to be able to say, OK, I now have enough information to make an informed decision that fits what I do and how I consume energy. So that's challenge number one, is getting access to that information. Number two, and I consider this to be one of the most important, is accountability. Who's responsible to initiate some of these local renewable energy projects? Is it council? Is it you guys? Is it the state government, the federal government? Who is it? There is no current accountability for these types of projects. And I think you're lucky in this region to have a mayor and a supportive team of council who are actually putting their hand up. And as I think you said a little bit earlier, Jack, that's just getting in and doing something. There's a lot of talk about projects in the renewable energy industry and particularly in the hydrogen industry. When push comes to shove and you ask someone to spend money or dedicate resources, or mm, don't worry about the other one of you first. So accountability is a really critical factor when it comes to these type of projects, and it's something that is a real industry challenge. So congratulations, Jack, and to, to the council team for, for getting started and doing something. 
market conditions, another real key industry challenge because as Ian was identifying earlier, there are still developing technologies. Developing technologies usually mean they cost a little bit more. So to actually transition from your current efficient fossil fuel energy consumption to renewable energy, quite possibly going to cost you money. And so the market conditions are a key challenge. If you're a business that spends $2 million a year on electricity and gas combined, are you going to make a conscious business de decision to maybe spend $2.2 or $2.4 million a year for a couple of years and oh, it'll get cheaper? I don't think so. That's a market condition that makes it really difficult for businesses to make that transition. Supply and demand. While there is increased supply and demand in some of the more traditional renewable energies like solar uh, and wind power, hydrogen, who's making it? Who's buying it? Who's selling it? So that supply and demand curve needs to become a little bit more mature and what is one of the market challenges that we're faced by the industry at the moment. One of the key points to understand if you're looking to identify why you should initiate local renewable energy projects is the retention of local energy capital. Now, being able to understand this is really critically important. And I've got some figures in some slides coming up which will show how this impacts the local area here. But essentially, if you can understand, firstly, the volume and the cost of how much your region or even at a more micro scale, your business, of the energy that's consumed, step number one. You'll see on the right hand side of the screen there, um, the results of an energy capital audit that our business performed for a smaller regional council uh, here in Queensland. We were able to analyse that as a region per year, they spent $42.5 million on buying energy into the local area. 100% of their energy was purchased from outside of their LGA or local government area. That's money that's leaving the local area. So we started to think, well, if you had local renewable energy projects within an area, firstly, you've got an opportunity to decarbonise your local economy. Second, you've got an opportunity to retain that energy capital and keep it within your LGA. Now, keeping in that case $42 million, which I think in that council represented about 6% of their gross regional product. So it's not a huge amount, but it's still a good percentage of GRP. Imagine keeping that money within the region, the investment that you'll be able to attract, the jobs you, that you'll be able to create. There is such a great impact, not just from an environmental perspective, from decarbonising the economy, but an economic and commercial impact that can be realised from keeping that money that your businesses and residents are spending right now into the local area. How do you do that? Well, first, you've got to understand what the current energy consumption is. How much you're using? Petrol, gas, diesel, electricity. How much is being consumed in your region? Secondly, how much does, does that cost? Well, it's a difficult proposition to ask people to pay more for energy. It's tough. And in certain circumstances, that will certainly apply. But that's the second component of the energy capital audit. Third is where are they buying their energy from? Now, I haven't done a full analysis of the local area here, but I could pretty much guarantee that most of the energy that's being used in the Wide Bay Burnett region is purchased from outside the Wide Bay Burnett region. And it, there is increased um, household or, and business rooftop solar, which is great, but when you consider how much energy is being consumed in the local area, it might present a really large opportunity. But understanding the volume, the cost, and where this energy uh, is coming from allows you to identify opportunities to say, okay, well, what if we were to just in the next two years initiate this project that will claw a little bit of that back? And it might even help a couple of businesses become a little bit more operationally uh, commercial at the same time. So you can identify opportunities from understanding first, how does your region consume energy? How much does it cost? And where is it coming from? So that's the first step. Identifying the opportunities and the impacts, most importantly, uh, is the second step. And finally, what are the projects that can act as catalysts? Really important because, as you were saying earlier, um, Jack, 
it's great that people can talk about this and maybe shine a, a you know, produce a nice glossy report of 200 pages saying you should do this and you should do that and that would be great. Why, don't, why doesn't everybody else do this? It doesn't make it real until you actually do something. And so understanding what the most um, immediate and feasible projects are to make that happen uh, is really an important part of that process. What you see here is a very, very simple diagram of an example uh, of that regional council uh, that we've been able to work with. Now, we didn't start on the left-hand side, as most of these types of processes do. We started on the right-hand side. Uh, and um, in this particular region, we actually started working with five local businesses to understand their energy profile. So we went in and we said, we want your electrical data, we want your gas data, we want your petrol and diesel data. We want to understand how you consume energy so that we can reverse engineer a renewable energy solution tailored to what you need. And in this regional area, it was a cotton gin, it was a stock feed processing plant, it was a local engineering shop, a caravan park, and an aerodrome. So not exactly for one, <laughs> uh, one sector of the local industry, but it represented a very broad base of energy consumption. And so we were able to work with these businesses and say, okay, how much energy do you consume? How much does it cost? Where are you getting it from? And if we were to come up with a renewable energy solution for you, what would that look like? Once we'd established that, great, okay. Where are we gonna get the renewable energy from? And that's why we've been working with the local council to understand how we can utilise their wastewater treatment plant, uh, as Ian was identifying uh, in his earlier presentation, to produce renewable energy. It makes sense at wastewater treatment plants now because utilisation of oxygen helps them to run better, makes them cheaper to run, uh, and it has potential delayed capital impact as well. So that's the production side. The consumption side, working with local businesses specifically and customising a solution for them, Again, key component uh, of what will make this work. The bit in the middle, the distribution, is where we're able to use embedded gas networks or reticulated gas networks, and potentially in the future some community fuel cell projects as well, where the hydrogen from a wastewater treatment plant gets shipped into a fuel cell and that fuel cell is activated uh, by several different houses or businesses to access power. So, beginning with the end in mind, who are the consumers? Uh, and very similar to the way that the solar industry has become so prevalent in Australia through a consumer-led market, how can we look in the local context at looking at local businesses first? How do they consume energy? How can we create a renewable energy solution based on what they need and reverse engineer that? Because the, the engineers in the room might not agree with me, but the production will stack up. We'll make it work. We'll get the solar farms and the wind farms and the the biohydrogen plants and the green hydrogen plants to make the renewable energy. We need to work on the bit in the middle and the bit in the end. And that's where a lot of this work, using the local approach, uh, is really focused on. Some big numbers up on that screen. And while they are very general in their calculation, they're by no way specific, there's certainly something that can be a bit of a conversation starter for this local community to understand the size of the opportunity that you have for locally produced and locally used renewable energy. Wide Bay Burnett region has just a touch over 300,000 residents. On average, an Australian resident consumes 19 megawatt hours, uh, sorry, kilowatt hours of power a day. And the average cost of electricity, and bearing in mind this is just electricity by itself, no petrol, no diesel, no gas. $344.10 is the average cost for one megawatt of power across Australia. Depending on where you are, it could be cheaper, it could be more. Um, but that's the average. So if you were to translate that into a daily and yearly spend of electricity alone in the local region, Wide Bay Burnett is spending $2 million a day on electricity. Multiply that by 365 days a year, you have $730 million of energy capital being spent by your residents and businesses on electricity alone. Now, I'm not sure because I haven't gone and done the research, 
but I'm pretty sure that close to 100% of that $730 million is leaving the local area. Wouldn't it be great if we could keep some, most, or all of that $730 million here in the Wide Bay Burnett area? So I'll leave you with that to think about uh, and uh, look forward to hearing from the other speakers as we develop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Absolutely wonderful and uh, some more really great things for us to, to think about and take away. Our next speaker will actually be joining us virtually, Philip Stone from ReCarbon Inc. Philip is the Australian-based um, Executive Vice President of Business Development for ReCarbon, which is headquartered in Santa Clara, California, USA. He spent the last eight years building local and global stakeholder relationships as the company moved through its technology readiness level development. With successful pilot and demonstration plants established, Philip has spent the last two years helping deploy ReCarbon's technology in commercial projects, both exciting biohydrogen projects and important carbon capture and utilisation, which we keep hearing about in the last few days, projects which together will assist in the decarbonisation of key industries by the utilisation of renewable and waste greenhouse gases. Just waiting for the sound, all good. We're then going to have um, Heidi Breen from H2Q um, with the H2Q and Working Groups update. So that's going to be exciting as well. Hydrogen Mobility Solutions and then the morning tea break. So uh, I think that's going to be well worth it. But if you are wanting to have tea and coffee and so on, please... Um, Avail yourself of that in the meantime. Ben, you ready to go? We're, uh, we're going to speak from Philip a little bit later when we get those technical things. So our next um, speaker 
Hi, Emily. Hey, sorry. The tech guys aren't working out um, how to get, like, we've got your video, but we don't have your sound up. Yeah. So we're just going to have Ben now yeah. and push you back. So they're going to work in the background to try and get the sound. Okay, I'll just wait. Sorry about that. We'll keep you in the loop with how it's going. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bye. 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 Economics. Ben has held roles in local economic development and corporate advisory. Before joining Bundaberg Regional Council, he was a director with Deloitte Access Economics, where he consulted to some of Australia's largest corporations and institutions. We're very lucky that Ben now lives here at Burnett Heads and is interested in building Australia's best regional economy and community, including a focus on the bioeconomy. Please welcome Ben Artup. Oh, thank you, Trish, for that great introduction. I couldn't have written it better myself. Um, it so sounds very, very good. So I'm hoping I can get my presentation up. Um, I'll try and catch, uh, pick up a bit of time. I know we're running behind schedule. Um, and this presentation I've done today, I've done it a few times now. I've been asked to talk about our, our green hydrogen um, garbage truck project. And I hope today is the very last time I actually have to talk about the project that's currently in planning uh, and we're currently going through the funding process. Uh, and the next time I talk about it, it'll be in six months' time when we're actually starting the delivery of this project um, that I'll talk about today. Um, so I guess just as a bit of background, I guess, um, you know, there's been a lot of announcements recently around the hydrogen space and roadmap and net zero targets that, that state, local, federal uh, governments are coming out with. Uh, there's been big private sector announcements around the hydrogen opportunity particularly, uh, which are all very, very exciting. And um, I guess as we heard uh, Ian talk about this morning, the big opportunity is around the domestic use case that we think that this project's really um, uh, jumping onto. Uh, the things around long-term hydrogen export are very, very exciting long-term projects that will help our region and position our region uh, in the hydrogen space because we'll be able to leverage off those. But we're really talking about delivering something on the ground here in Bundaberg that takes advantage of, of the opportunity, the, the feedstock we have here, uh, a lot of the opportunity in that that ingenuity and invention that uh, Ian also sp spoke about um, earlier. But I guess re why our region, uh, the story I want to go through today is not just about um, hydrogen garbage trucks, it's a story about how we're using the bioeconomy and a specific project to help transition our region uh, from old economy, you know, uh, industries into the new renewable energy based industries and the bioeconomy and how we're making that transition um, for, for reasons obviously that are driven by climate change, uh, uh, but also the opportunity to create jobs and de-risk our economy and decarbonise de our economy and make sure that um, we move towards that net zero target over time. Um, but I guess our region, why we're positioned um, well for the bioeconomy, it's obviously climate, you know, great climate, uh, so, you know, soils, water se security that make us a great agricultural producing region. Uh, we're the third largest agricultural growing region uh, in Queensland. Uh, which gives us the opportunity to provide feedstock for, bi for the bioeconomy. Um, there's lots of, if you read any of the big agricultural reports, about 25% of Australia's agricultural produce rots in the field. That's just a, a fact of, of the sector and industry. So how do we turn that wa waste product into an opportunity or an economic resource that can be used to, to, um, to grow our region? Um, so that's one of our, uh, our opportunities, I guess. But the story around the renewable energy sector, the bioeconomy, it's not a new concept. It's something our region's been doing for over 140 years. We just have new terms for it now around bioeconomy, circular economy, renewable energy space. But it's actually an old concept that um, our region has been doing for a long time and we've been very, very successful at it. And where, I guess, it started to some extent, um, uh, 140 years ago, not our first industry, but one of our first big industries was around sugarcane. Um, and this brand here that's um, up on the board there, ev everybody in Australia will know this brand and this name. And if you know this brand, you know a little bit about Bundaberg um, in terms of Bundaberg Sugar and, and, and that company. So when um, that, that, that company, for example, started back in um, at the 1880s, one of the waste products of sugarcane production was obviously molasses. And what do you do when you've got a, an abundance or surplus of molasses sitting around? You put two and two in together and you innovate and you come up with a new product. And one of those products uh, that another household brand that every single person in Australia knows and has drunk, uh, if you drink, uh, Bundaberg Rum, another brand that sort of defines our, our region. Um, going forward another 100 years, baby boomers consumer products, another product that we had coming out of our agricultural sector, when you're growing a lot of ginger sitting around, you can make soft drinks. Uh, so another great brand that, that our region's famous for, uh, Ginger Beer, uh, now uh, exports more than uh, it supplies to the Australian market and a global enterprise that's um, 
creating a lot of jobs in our, our region and is still expanding. Um, of course, I innovation, when you're, um, you know, you're distilling certain uh, drinks at the, at the rum factory, you want to go out on your own, you want to make your, your own product. Uh, gin's another a great product that's coming out of our region. So it was a distiller from Bundy Rum that wanted to produce um, rum as well, but it, rum takes three years to mature in a barrel. So what are you doing? You've got a, a, a cash flow issue short term. You can make gin in six weeks to get some cash flow to get through a problem. And that level of innovation drove a new product, uh, uh, Kiaki Moon Gin, within the first two years of that uh, business being started, won the best gin in the world for under $50 uh, worldwide, another great success story. And to round out this theme of alcohol and sugar, um, of course it wouldn't be complete without craft beer, another modern innovation in drinking technology, uh, another company that um, created the, the Thirsty Turtle, which is now being launched around the world as well and, and run by a company called uh, Ballistic Craft Beer. So that story of innovation is, you know, the born out of our region's DNA and our strength in agriculture. Uh, but are also other products. We're the, we're the largest manufacturer of macadamias in Australia. We're the largest uh, producer of avocados in Australia. We're the largest producer of, of sweet potatoes in Australia. And we produce a lot of other horticultural products as well. But it's not just agriculture. These products are transforming and being used and um, uh, being evaluated in very, very smart and sophisticated ways, innovative ways to get these products uh, not just agricultural products, uh, but other products uh, into supermarkets, into the supply chains, and they've been uh, promoted into Smash Davo and uh, all sorts of freeze-dried products and, and uh, food stocks that go into global uh, you know, supermarket chains now around the world. But this tr you know, transition that's occurring um, to the bioeconomy, companies that you hear about today and success stories that are already participating successfully in the bioeconomy, companies like Orico, uh, Essential Queensland, uh, Green Solutions Wide Bay, all companies that are successful in our region creating jobs and already picking up on this trend of the, of the bioeconomy uh, and tr you know, transitioning our region from the old sectors to, to sustainably based um, industries um, in our region uh, right now. But where we sort of started this, uh, I guess, discussion around this project, this opportunity around hydrogen, which is a big opportunity, was last year at this conference. So. This is the second conference at the first conference. One of the co conversations that came out of the conference was around hydrogen uh, and, and what that could mean for our region. And even 12 months ago, the concept of the, the national hydrogen agenda and discussion wasn't as um, advanced as it is right now. It wasn't, we didn't have a, a lot of private sector and government policy catching up to, to work out how, we, uh, how Australia positions itself in, in the hydrogen in industry. Uh, and out of that conversation 12 months ago, um, we um, did a few things. First thing we did was we launched the Bundaberg Biohub in partnership with Utilitas, uh, and you'll hear a bit about an overview of the Biohub today. One of the first of 100 planned Biohubs in Australia, the uh, first fully uh, master planned Biohub uh, in our region, and, and that's a little picture of it there, and you might think that just looks like an old council wastewater treatment facility, mainly because it is council's old wastewater treatment facility <laughs> that we managed um, to transition uh, as an asset that we didn't need anymore for uh, purposes to the private sector who could see an economic value in using that asset as a biohub going into the future. So, uh, and Dan will talk about that and he launched that last year quite successfully and there's a lot of uh, tenancies and, and biomanufacturing and bio uh, companies that are going into that um, hub that you'll see at this conference uh, this year. Uh, the other conversation was about how we, how we advance the, the hydrogen opportunity and we set up a, a hydrogen technology cluster. So basically what that was was knowing this opportunity coming we needed to solve two problems. We needed to create demand for hydrogen use cases in our region, uh, and we needed the, the technology and the expertise and the private sector capital to come forward with how to produce it. But we also needed somebody, as everybody's been talking about today, who's going to be the customer, who's going to use hydrogen, <coughs> and how we're going to actually solve that, 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 that uh, problem to actually kickstart the development of the hydrogen industry. So our cluster's only started in February. It's had about three or four meetings so far. And that other picture there, is basically local industry that come there to learn about the hydrogen opportunity from experts. And what we're hoping is that companies that could potentially use hydrogen over time will develop the knowledge, the understanding, and the capacity to how to integrate hydrogen into their operations or their fleet or other purposes over, over time to create demand and use cases in our region to buy hydrogen essentially at, at its most uh, sim simple, simple level. Uh, and that's going really well. But out of those conversations have come a, a couple of critical consortiums or groups that have been put together to um, drive the opportunity. One 
is obviously Utilitas, who you hear about today, and, and um, Brew Carbon, who's not in speaker right now, but I think Annette. And what they're doing is they're sort of technology providers that will produce and um, uh, the hydrogen in our region that we can do right now, so at that, that capacity. The other one is around the vehicle side. Uh, there's probably two big use cases for hydrogen right now. One's around mobility and transport that we're looking at through this project. And the other one that's been talked about already twice today is around the wastewater treatment plant opportunities. So this project obviously picks up on that, that first theme of uh, mobility and transport. Um, so what came out of that, that discussion in the technology class is a new consortium that has been formed between Superior Pack and Hyzo. And we're lucky that Superior Pack, you know, located a few kilometres from where we're standing right now, Australia's largest manufacturer of, uh, of garbage trucks in Australia. So happened to be in Bundaberg and that uh, formed a beautiful marriage between them and Hyzon, which are one of the world's leading manufacturers in uh, drive, drive train and fuel cell technology for hydrogen vehicles, who have partnered up into a consortium to, to bring into Australia, assemble, distribute and supply hydrogen uh, heavy vehicles, uh, particularly garbage trucks for councils. Uh, and our council still obviously um, we still run our, our, our garbage truck fleet internally as a, as a business unit as a council. So it gives us the, the ability as an organisation to bring in and swap out some of our vehicles, our normal uh, garbage trucks for hydrogen uh, vehicles. <coughs> so that's some of the stuff that's come out of the, the cluster group. So how it would work, how our, our um, project that you know, today would work, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, on the left there is where the hydrogen will be produced through the biohub. So the consortium of Recarbon and Utilitas have got the expertise and the capital and the know-how to produce biohydrogen from the biohub. Um, uh, and the interesting thing about the proposal that we've got, that we're putting together right now, is the biohub will have Australia's first publicly available commercial scale hydrogen refuelling station uh, located here in Bundaberg uh, when this project gets going. So. There's uh, refuelling stations down at QUT, got a, one small one, which, which Ian talked about earlier. There's one I've heard in the ACT government's got one for their fleet, uh, their uh, passenger fleet vehicle in the ACT. They've got the vehicles, the refuelling station, they just don't have the hydrogen yet. So it's a, it's a good idea, but it's not quite there yet in terms of uh, being fully operational, having an end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, so this will have that part of it. Um, on the other side there is the Hyzon Superior Pack Consortium that will pr produce the vehicles for the council. And right there in the middle is the council who, as people have been talking about already, somebody's got to put their hand up to say, we will buy and we will use hydrogen somewhere in, the, in a commercial use application. So that uh, is where we uh, bring in two of our, our, our garbage trucks, swap them out with hydrogen vehicles and enter into a, a service agreement or a lease arrangement with Hyzon and Superior Pack. And on the other side, we'd have a purchase agreement for the hydrogen fuel over time from the biohub. Um, and that'd be quite exciting because it'll, you know, it'll actually, people will be able to come to Bundaberg to see where you've got a complete end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain, and in this case, the hydrogen uh, vehicles. But the other exciting thing about it is it's about, uh, it's not just about garbage trucks or, uh, you know, an operational change within our organisation. It's about the jobs that will be created out of this new industry. Uh, and other investment we know will come to the biohub and is already looking at the biohub and other opportunities to decarbonise our, our organisation and, and the role we'll play in uh, net zero for the region. And it'll help us play a role in meeting a lot of the state and national climate change targets over time. Uh, so it's an exciting project. It's subject to um, a funding application of the state government at the moment. So if anyone knows the minister, I think we've got two ministers for hydrogen at the moment, um, but it's currently sitting on the minister's desk for funding approval. Uh, so the state will put money into it, the council will put money into it. We'd have some operational savings from uh, removing two of our diesel trucks and swapping them out with hydrogen. So it'd be small savings for us, but you know it's an expensive type of proposition. So it's something that the council would uh, look at in investing in over time. Um, so there's the biohub. The refueling station potentially then will go into this little slightly old map will be somewhere in the biohub at the bottom bottom there um, of how it'll work. So our vehicles would go there, fuel up, go out for their runs, and then come back um, over a two-year trial period, which is, is how it works. But I guess just to wrap up, and that story that I wanted to sort of emphasise around the transition of our, our economy and the history of where we've come and where we're going with, you know, um, with our region, I guess that's our Bundy Sugar our mill, our biggest mill, uh, still remaining. There's two, two mills in the region, been there for 140 years, um, you know, gave life to our, our region and our economy. 
um, back in all, for the, all those years. There's the, the run right next door where the molasses, where they you know, set up the run factory right next to the sugar, sugar mill, um, another great success story. And right next to that is where a lot of the offtake and the feedstock from those organisations will be able to use the, the feedstock business to buy hydrogen uh, at the bio plant, which is where we'll create the jobs of the future. And companies like Victoria Sachs and Reed Carbon will be those, those, those big names that, um, you know, similar to the, the Bundy rum and the Bundy sugar that have defined our region historically. Um, but it's quite exciting. I just want to talk about one other way we've, we've enabled this project and the connections and the, and the networking, the ability to connect people and come up with this type of a concept is through the work of QUT that have partnered with us through an MOU to um, ma make those connections. And that can't be underestimated how important connecting people and opportunities and all those relationships are in putting a project or an initiative like this together for our, for our region over time. And it links us into a lot of uh, important conversations that are necessary to advance a project. Um, so that's it. I, ho I hope I've caught up a little bit of time on the agenda um, and round to questions later. Thank you, Ben. We have caught up a few minutes, so that's good. Bio Bowsers, doesn't it have a, a good ring to it? We're very excited to see that happening in the Bundaberg region. Well, we'll next hear from Heidi Breen. Um, Heidi has over 10 years energy industry experience across network, energy retail and wholesale markets and energy services. Heidi most recently worked for Eureka, leading the business customer experience marketing and acceleration team with involvement in studies for solar PPAs, microgrids, batteries and hybrid energy systems. In Eureka, her leadership in complex solution selling saw her working with customers to solve their energy challenges using renewables, data, metering and visualisation and empowering energy prosumers through involvement in Eureka's virtual power plant. Today, Heidi wears many hats. She is CEO of H2Q, Queensland's hydrogen industry cluster based in southeast Queensland and an associate of Energy Market Matters Australia. Heidi consults to business clients and energy companies on all manner of energy transition matters from procurement and optimisation, technology adoption, solar and batteries, virtual power plants and decarbonisation. Originally from Newcastle, New South Wales, Heidi now resides on the Sunshine Coast with her husband, Philip, three-year-old daughter, Poppy, and puppy, Willow. We want to see a photo of Willow later. Please welcome Heidi Breen. Thank you very much. What an introduction. And um, to date, Willow, puppy Willow, and, uh, and daughter Poppy have been my audience for this presentation. So uh, you guys are the first outside of that very exclusive club uh, to hear from me today. So look, a big thank you um, for that very warm welcome and a thank you um, to the Bundaberg Regional Council um, for inviting me to speak today. Also for their support of H2Q. Um, the Bundaberg Regional Council joined us as a corporate partner very early on in the year and we're very proud to be associated with them and all of the great work they're doing here in the region. Um, they're in good company. They keep company with, um, with the likes of Stanwell, who are very active in the hydrogen project space in Queensland, um, Redlands Regional Council, um, Stellar Recruitment, just to name a few. So just as we've heard this morning, um, local government do have opportunities with wastewater treatment plants uh, that Dr McKinnon spoke about, and, um, and it's great to see them take the lead in the industry development discussions that we're having. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about who we are, what clusters actually are and how we came to this point. But um, I'm also going to share with you a little bit about uh, our industry development grassroots approach with an update on our working groups and how we're shaping the future of the hydrogen ecosystem in Queensland. Industry clusters, if you haven't heard of them, they're a collection of related firms, usually linked by a supply chain in a de defined geographical area. They share common markets, technologies, workforce development needs and services orientation. Participa the participants and the industry people that I'm working with are drawn in to the, the um, organisation to achieve things like competitive advantage, um, to get proximity to competitors, to actually develop skilled workforce and start to give focus to the supply and demand challenges that we've heard a little bit about already this morning. 
Um, they drive innovation, adaptation and creativity, which is really crucial to a nascent and newly emerging industry seeking to drive innovation and healthy competition. We have also need to learn from the, uh, the lessons of the past, and so we have great opportunity in the hydrogen space um, to take some of those lessons and reinvent. Let's, let's shortcut the six or seven years it took, say, for example, for Safer Together to come about and work together on industry standards and compliance for hydrogen in Queensland. That's one of the opportunities that I'm talking to some of the other clusters in Queensland about uh, and how we come together as a group to actually take on those, those challenges and, and bring some standardisation and policy discussion to the table. Um, HCQ very quickly um, established itself in March this year, so we're a very young organisation, uh, but our strategic focus areas <coughs> are very much centred around building Queensland's industry capability, um, having a look at that end user demand system that Ben spoke about, uh, that the, the Bundaberg Biohub are working very hard on, the Australian demand and Queensland capability, and obviously the sustainability of H2Q and the role that hydrogen industry clusters will play moving forward. Our working groups were formed in August of this year, so again, uh, fairly young on their journey, uh, but we've had many meetings um, and in fact a fantastic workshop last week where we've really started to get um, crystal clear on what the next 12 months looks like in terms of a roadmap, also on what um, our, our stakeholder journey looks like and the working groups are coming up with uh, strategies and a plan to bring about these focus areas. So community engagement um, is a focus for the working groups, demand aggregation, industry development and identifying roadblocks, skills development um, and investment supporting market development. H2Q champions the acceleration of hydrogen adoption and the development of a clean energy solution to deliver new jobs, regional prosperity and decarbonisation of our industries and communities. We were fortunate to win a grant uh, from NERA to establish ourselves. We were one of 13 clusters across Australia, I should mention, and one of three um, active clusters in Queensland, although I understand um, North Queensland are also positioning to, um, in Townsville uh, for a cluster to be formally developed. But there are wonderful industry um, centres all over Queensland that we seek to actually combine with and, um, and collaborate with. In, June, July, sorry, in July this year, we were incorporated as a not-for-profit um, limited by liability. This is Economex, and I introduced it to you because very early on we began collaborating and sharing a national capability database. So successful, it was picked up by NERA, and now it's available nationally. And anybody can go on to this database and register, it's completely free. Um, and so what we actually have is um, an international exposure and visibility to Australian business working in the hydrogen industry, and that's a great start for us to get visibility of, of who the players are exactly. It's going to be so important when H2Q um, continues to play that connecting and collaboration role moving forward. Our current activities. <coughs> well, we've been busy. Not very old, only a few months um, into our journey, and we're actually a volunteer organisation, besides me, and I'm employed two and a half days a week. Uh, let me tell you, um, because of my passion for decarbonisation and my background, um, it's a lot more than that. <laughs> but, um, but it's a labour of love, and, um, and I can see the opportunities that uh, the hydrogen industry has ahead, and the role that H2Q will play um, at a very grassroots level to connect the industry across the state. Um, this list of achievements since our launch, things like... Uh, incorporating, we have over 1,350 followers on, on LinkedIn that we engage with all the time. Um, we've done a Queensland ecosystem mapping, we launched Economex, we've um, taken part in Queensland Hydrogen Task Force participation, so our, our chair of the board is, uh, sits on the task force panel um, with Minister Grenning, and um, we do engagement with various organisations, um, established our partners and affiliates program, established our working groups, and I'm off to Mackay at the end of the month, and then a showcase of everything that we've been up to in December. So I'll be able to share in December our 12-month roadmap, as well as the actual actions that the working groups will be delivering in the next 12 months. So do get along to that if you're in Brisbane um, in early December. The, so for a young organisation, we've been very, very busy. Um, as I said, we're working closely with the other clusters around Queensland, um, to determine a future 
that is a, a Queensland-focused future, and everyone is welcome. So anyone that's interested in the hydrogen industry can actually come together and build upon and leverage our local capability for the global opportunity, because um, we don't close anybody out of involved in the, in our, with our working groups. If you have an interest in hydrogen, then we have a working group for you, and, um, and we'd love to see you there. On that note, um, I just have to do a quick plug for our breakfast tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I'm hosting breakfast down at Burnett Riverside Hotel. Uh, it starts at 7 for a 7.30 a.m. start, and I have um, the very lovely Tom Soulsby from Lion Energy um, on hand to have a very intimate conversation about the challenges around supply uh, and demand in the hydrogen industry. So it's only about 20 or so of us at breakfast. Um, it's going to be a fabulous event. Please, um, if you haven't registered, I've opened ticket sales back up. And for just $49, you can get along and have some breakfast, um, which is sure to be really lovely. So um, thanks again for having me here today. Lovely to meet you all. And I'm here for the day um, to talk to you back again about virtual power plants a little bit later. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Heidi. You can tell Poppy and Willow that you did very well. So, <laughs> Well, we will now break for morning tea. So we'll uh, do some testing of the IT while uh, you're all outside. So we'll let you know we may come back in about 20 minutes. We may make it a little bit longer. So go out, enjoy some uh, delicious morning tea, do some networking, and uh, we'll let you know when we're right to come back in. Thank you.
our first two speakers we're actually going to hear from virtually and hopefully we will hear them because we will see them and then assure that that's the case. Our first speaker is Philip Stone who's Australian-based Executive Vice President of Business Development for We Carbon Inc which is headquartered in Santa Clara, California, USA. Philip has spent the last two years helping deploy recarbons technology in commercial projects, both exciting biohydrogen projects Sorry, Philip, you're just getting introduced now. ...and metallisation projects, which together will assist in the decarbonisation of key industries by the utilisation of renewable and waste greenhouse gases. Please welcome Philip Stone. All right, and I'm sending you live in three, two, one. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Philip Son, uh, EVP of Business Devel Development for Recarbon, Inc. Um, so great to uh, not see you all, unfortunately, but i um, glad to be with you. Um, I'm just going to thank uh, the mayor and all the folks at Bundaberg Regional Council and great stakeholder group that we built um, with uh, Utilitas and Hyzon Motors and, of course, uh, Superior Pack um, as well. And uh, I might just start by showing a uh, brief video and we can get going. Imagine a commercial technology solution that produces cost-effective hydrogen and syngas from greenhouse gas emissions. ReCarbon does just that, using proprietary microwave plasma technology to reduce and reuse carbon emissions, making it an ideal process for a lower emissions energy economy. The core component of ReCarbon's Plasma Carbon Conversion Unit, or PCCU, is the emission blade, the result of over 50 years of combined experience in energy system development and optimization has led to this revolutionary innovation. Proprietary atmospheric microwave plasma technologies provide a simple and energy efficient solution for GHG recycling. Each emission blade is powered by a magnetron generating microwaves through a waveguide which interact with carbon dioxide and methane as it enters the plasma reactor where the gases are disassociated into hydrogen and carbon monoxide, or syngas. Carbon monoxide can be further processed to maximize hydrogen production. ReCarbon has identified two key approaches for the application of its patented technology. Our industrial approach focuses on the industrial CO2 emissions and converting them into syngas or hydrogen. This strategy creates value from harmful waste gases. Recarbon can contribute significantly to industrial CO2 emissions reduction and decarbonizing industries such as coal and natural gas fire power generation, steel, petrochemical, and cement industries. By converting emissions to syngas, industry can either use the high Hi, so sorry, everyone. I just realized that the uh, video was not playing. That's fine. Um, we'll have to uh, go look at that another day. Uh, you can jump on YouTube and check that out. Um, and I will share screen again just to the presentation part. Apologies for that. So um, ReCarbon is a uh, microwave plasma activated partial oxidation dry methane reforming technology. Uh, and uh, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, essentially it is a non-combustion, a combustion-free process that processes greenhouse gases of methane and carbon dioxide 
into syngas, and then from syngas, which is hydrogen and carbon monoxide, further into hydrogen to maximize hydrogen. The uh, image that you can see on the screen is that of our plasma carbon conversion unit, which is a collection of um, collection of uh, emission blades, which is the core component of our technology. And it can process about 400 uh, cubic meters per hour of biogas, both the methane and the CO2 component, and generate over 800 kilograms of hydrogen per day. Uh, I'm sure John Keenan from Hyzon Motors will give you a good reference of what that means in terms of hydrogen mobility. We can stack these four high in a, on the single footprint uh, to produce uh, 3.2 tons of hydrogen per day. And if you wanted to produce more, of course, you can just set them alongside each other. So this is a quick uh, um, image of uh, rendering of a one module uh, biohydrogen plant. So I showed you the container. So the container is the blue uh, box over by the right hand side there. And you can see the balance of plant being a air separation unit, uh, hydrogenation, water gas shift reactor, and then a hydrogen PSA, uh, sort of from bottom to top, I guess, in terms of input gas. Uh, and then output gas uh, coming through. And you can see it's still very uh, modest size, 20 meters uh, by 26.7 meters. Uh, it is certainly our uh, plan to be building this scale um, at Bundaberg in the first instance uh, and uh, looking for that 800 kilogram um, of hydrogen demand. We can actually um, proceed with a plant with just about 400 kilograms of hydrogen per day um, uh, demand, uh, but certainly uh, have room to expand to that 800 kilograms per day. So um, Recarbon's biogas to hydrogen process, uh, we uh, term as B2H2, and B2H2 obviously stands for biogas to hydrogen. Uh, you can see uh, on the top diagram um, B2H2 solution. Um, the biomass AD, anaerobic digestion, or landfill gas, or wastewater um, treatment, anaerobic digestion, as the feed gas uh, to be put through to our PCCU. It does need to be scrubbed uh, of some impurities, and that CO2 and CH4 stream uh, then enter into our PCCU. As I mentioned, we use oxygen as well uh, through an air separation unit. And so O2 in, CO2 and CH4 in, and that goes through our PCCU, where a plasma reaction dissociates those gases of CO2, CH4 and O2 into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide is further processed through water gas shift reaction and then the, the hydrogen stream is put through a hydrogen pressure swing absorption unit, which purifies it to fuel cell grade hydrogen. And you can see also this arrow uh, on the top, uh, top a bit um, to the right hand side, uh, showing steam and heat output, uh, water, and also food grade CO2 as well. Uh, so going all the way back to Professor McKinnon's um, uh, talk. He mentioned the nexus between energy, food, and water. Uh, I'd like to bring into play not just food, but organics, organics that we consume and organics that we consider to be waste, but using that waste uh, to be a resource instead. And of course, water. So we create steam, we create energy through heat, uh, and also um, food grade CO2 as well is a byproduct of our hydrogen production. And that can actually be utilized for those who are familiar with electrolysis in the electrolysis uh, process itself. Electrolysis obviously needs electricity, which can be provided from our heat conversion. It needs water, which can be taken from our steam conversion. Uh, and then it generates oxygen which actually can then be used 
uh, in lieu of the air separation unit or reduce the size of the air separation unit that we need. And you get a meaningful boost up of hydrogen production by essentially doing co-generation of hydrogen uh, production, co-production of hydrogen through our process and also the integration of electrolyzers. It's a very interesting process that we're doing um, in uh, other projects around the world. Below here uh, in the below diagram um, is the process carbon intensity of that one PCC module biohydrogen plant. You can see on the left-hand side, 38,000 tons of CO2E, CO2 equivalent per year. And that's based on a 25 times global warming potential for methane. You may have uh, read a lot about methane recently in the lead up to COP26, which is occurring in Glasgow right now. Uh, but uh, there's a global methane agreement, which Australia uh, currently has not agreed to. But methane is a very powerful uh, global warming um, uh, greenhouse gas, uh, and it's rated at 25 tons at the moment, although there are moves to move it to 86 times uh, in the near future. In the middle of the lower diagram, you can see that process that I described uh, uh, that's uh, mirrored to the upper diagram. And you can see that taking in 38,000 tons of CO2e per year, we emit 6,600 tons of CO2e in that food grade CO2 I was mentioning. So essentially, this process is carbon negative. Uh, it is not uh, zero emissions. It's better than that. It's carbon negative to the tune of negative 31,400 tons of CO2e per year. So that's basically a carbon reduction uh, through that process. This is just accounting for our process, doesn't account for the source of electricity um, that we are drawing um, uh, it, into the mix. If we use grid electricity, obviously it won't be as good, uh, but I'll show you in the next slide that we are hoping to use renewable electricity at every point uh, and uh, potentially even biogas driven electricity. So this diagram, if you've been to any of our uh, biohydrogen technology cluster meetings in the past, um, you may have seen this diagram. We have partnered, of course, with Fiona at uh, Utilitas. Professor McKinnon actually uh, um, matched us together. It's been a really great and fruitful relationship uh, and really grateful for that. Uh, well, Utilitas, of course, is the expert at converting biomass into biogas via anaerobic digestion, and that biogas would be then scrubbed. Um, the CO2 and CH4, the methane, would be put through our recarbon PCCU. You see in the uh, image uh, there of the green container, that's actually our demonstration plant in Bradley, Tennessee. Uh, we would be building something, uh, of course, larger than that in Bundaberg that produces the uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide, as I mentioned, and that goes through the water gas shift and hydrogen PSA to produce hydrogen. And then it's already touched upon this project, so I won't bore you with repeating it, uh, but uh, we will have a hydrogen refueling station uh, from Haskell, and uh, um, that refueling station uh, will be, uh, of course, dispensing uh, fuel cell grade hydrogen uh, the, the first customers for that hydrogen, of course, is the Bundaberg Regional Council, and the vehicles or the use case for that hydrogen are the uh, Hyzon and Superior Pack partnered uh, fuel cell waste trucks, uh, and of course, uh, Hyzon also builds prime movers, heavy trucks, uh, and also buses. That's the image uh, on the right-hand side there of the bus uh, that's uh, being used at Fortescue Metals uh, in WA. Um, and so it's a very, very exciting project. I can say that um, this project, this uh, uh, really modest project with the leadership of the Munderberg Regional Council has activated certainly a national uh, transport a sector for fuel cell mobility, um, which is uh, in garbage collection and waste trucks. And of course you have there in your region, local region, um, Superior Pack, which Ben also touched upon, uh, who build most of the waste trucks in Australia and uh, also in New Zealand uh, as well. And so by initiating this uh, stakeholder group and this project, 
that we've already activated a national uh, um, uh, transport sector uh, which will utilize hydrogen. And I can say uh, that uh, partnership with Hyzon and others have been accelerating at pace, essentially repeating this uh, model uh, that we put together uh, here in Bundaberg. So uh, really a great first project that has had uh, tremendous knock-on effects as well. And uh, the mayor also mentioned at the beginning of the conference that uh, Bundaberg Regional Council um, sponsored, was a gold sponsor of the Australian Hydrogen Conference uh, alongside the CSIRO. And I can say we were all there together and uh, it really was a bit of a big bang um, that uh, put Bundaberg on the map uh, and this project on the map. So we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, I just wanna finish uh, with this particular uh, slide here with regards to the topic um, of the presentation, which is essentially the developed demand for biohydrogen, of course, uh, but that it is repeatable and scalable. Uh, we have already seen the repeatability of it by uh, establishing projects like this in other states, in other locations, be it at landfills, uh, be it at uh, other biomass, biogas sites, and also wastewater treatment sites uh, where they are doing anaerobic digestion. And at the top of the diagram, this is a very closed loop uh, type situation, uh, which actually applies to quite a lot of uh, business entities uh, throughout Australia and the world. Uh, where at the top there, you can see um, the biomass owner. So this could be um, the landfill where there's organics, organics decomposing, producing landfill gas, which is uh, composed mostly of methane and CO2, could be at a wastewater treatment facility where the sewage, uh, if anaerobically digested, will also produce uh, CO2 and methane. And of course, like Bundaberg, taking food waste, uh, um, agriculture waste, livestock waste, and converting that resource, that biomass, into biogas through anaerobic digestion. Those operations, and I've already engaged with some of them in the Bundaberg region, in the wider region as well, um, and, and of course nationally and internationally, but uh, in, in Bundaberg, in that area, it's not lost on me, the amount of agricultural and livestock activities that are occurring um, in the Bundaberg region. There is plenty of biomass, and those operations also may have a significant diesel utilization. So I'm talking about uh, vehicles, I'm talking about generators um, and uh, uh, other equipment that currently use diesel. So really what we're trying to do here is, uh, again, at the nexus of the bioeconomy and the hydrogen economy, and speaking to also that uh, um, triangular uh, system that uh, uh, Professor McKinnon had mentioned in terms of energy, water and food or organics is that these uh, fleet and equipment owners may also be the biomass owners and thus can also produce biogas. So biogas is a feedstock for our system, uh, but also in other projects um, uh, outside of Bundaberg as well, we're looking for the biogas to actually produce the electricity to power our system. I spoke earlier about the source of electricity. And so we can source both the electricity and the feedstock gas for our system through biogas derived from community biomass. And it's essentially all of those two are behind the meter as it were. And then eventually your hydrogen produced through our B2H2 process would also be behind the meter. Um, that can be uh, sent through to critical power at the bottom there. There's an image of a fuel cell uh, gen generator, uh, which hi I'm sure John Fina from Heisman would be happy to talk to you about. And then on the right-hand side, you see the hydrogen refueling station, according to the previous diagram that you've heard about, the Haspel refueling station, the uh, Heisman uh, fuel cell waste trucks, and of course, uh, prime movers and also buses. And then on the left-hand side, we also have an emerging use case for hydrogen in uh, current diesel uh, um, uh, equipment and vehicles, 
that might be difficult uh, for fuel cell applications or the fuel cell applications haven't come on stream yet or the use case is not quite uh, up there for utilization as compared to prime movers, buses, and waste trucks. Uh, those may be, you may have diesel generators that you would like um, to reduce your emissions. The same thing with commercial vehicles, small diesel trucks, agricultural equipment, diesel tractors, of which of course there are a lot of, I think someone said the most of in, in some vehicle category. And this particular diesel uh, utilization is essentially diesel injection into existing diesel engines. So uh, it can use about 20 to 30% displacement of diesel. So if you wanted to reduce your emissions by 20 or 30%, which is a bit of a hot topic right now at COP26, and you wanna do that before 2030, uh, this might be an easy way to do that is to essentially inject hydrogen into your diesel uh, equipment, your existing fleet, your existing equipment uh, as a transition path uh, towards fuel cell, which of course is zero emission. So I just really wanted to present this particular diagram uh, to kind of initiate some interest uh, with regards to connecting the bioeconomy to the hydrogen economy locally, um, and also uh, in terms of that uh, um, axis of um, water, energy, and uh, also organics or food or food waste. So um, with that, I will uh, stop sharing screen. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a bit odd speaking um, into silence, uh, but I hope that's uh, all good. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Excellent. Can we please thank Philip? Have a great Marley. conference. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. There's some really fantastic things there that are really going to help us move forward. Our next speaker is also joining us virtually, Dr. John Seaman, the Commercial Director for Hyzon Motors Australia, based in Sydney. John holds a Bachelor of Science Honours degree from Sydney University, a Master's of Science <laughs> from the Imperial <laughs> College of Sydney. Hi, Johnny, you there? Oops, sorry, John, I can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry, I had my mute on. Yep, all good. There we go. Beautiful. So Trish is just doing your introduction now, um, mm -hmm. and I will get you sent live as soon as she's finished. Okay, no problem. Alrighty. Yep, alrighty, I'm sending you live in three, two, one. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, apologies, I can't be there in person today, but uh, hopefully uh, this presentation will give you some indication of um, Hyzon Motors and the solutions that we're providing in the hydrogen uh, economy. A disclaimer, Hyzon believes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles will play a vital role in the decarbonisation of Australia's transport sector. Um, some of the drivers associated for that include the fact that our aims with uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology is, is really to replace uh, diesel and diesel uh, vehicles. And in many respects, that's about achieving tear weight parity, which is ensuring that the zero emission solution that you have is comparable to the current vehicles. And so you're not compromising on payload uh, for heavy duty, long haul transportation. With respect to uh, the vehicles themselves and, and the landscape in which they're operating, Australia is um, unique in many respects. We've got a very vast uh, remote landscape, uh, very used to having long haul vehicles. We have uh, a lot of CO2 emission from those vehicles uh, in a very challenging environment. And whilst there's uh, electrification available, uh, really we've got the opportunity with hydrogen to uh, replace uh, that uh, zero emission solution and replace also the dependency on, on diesel imports, which you've heard about today as well. So what's the benefit of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles? Uh, they can provide long range. Uh, they can provide quick refueling, very similar to diesel vehicles. They're only emitting wa water vapor from the uh, tailpipe. Uh, they're quiet for effectively an electric vehicle quiet operation. They can operate in a wide range of temperatures. 
but because they're uh, fuel cell electric, they're a much simpler vehicle in many respects in construction than a diesel uh, vehicle. And so you've got reduced maintenance and servicing, got the opportunity to utilize sustainable domestic fuel sources, which we've heard about today. And whilst they still carry a battery, we don't need vast um, you know, volumes of uh, battery on payload uh, to compromise the vehicle efficiency. So highs on vehicles, they're currently on the road today and really working uh, actively towards uh, providing utilization in this sector uh, globally. So who are we? So Hyzon is focused as a zero emissions hydrogen fuel cell um, vehicle provider. And we focus mainly on the heavy duty uh, commercial vehicles. We listed on NASDAQ in July of this year. Uh, so we're a US parented company, but with operations also in Europe, Asia, and of course here in Australia. So we supply heavy duty trucks, buses, and coaches as mentioned, and we work then in targeting those vehicles that are really uh, diesel heavy uh, uh, consumers. So we're a growing organization. Uh, we, our parent company is Horizon Fuel Cell Technologies, which was started in Singapore in 2003. So that heritage of producing fuel cells over for nearly 20 years embeds itself in the way that we develop our uh, IP, our technology around the fuel cells to get the best outcomes and uh, optimization of the vehicle designs. <clears throat> then we partner with others in the hydrogen ecosystem space, which whether it be for refuelers, service maintenance, telemetrics, uh, finance, etc. Currently we have over 500 heavy duty vehicles uh, on the roads and that's growing uh, daily. And we have uh, four manufacturing hubs uh, globally. So really the heart and soul for Hyzon is its continual innovation in heavy duty fuel cell and fuel cell application. So our IP is, is around ensuring that we're always pushing the envelope in terms of uh, application and performance. So currently our heaviest uh, duty or highest power fuel cell for mobility is 150 kilowatts in one fuel cell stack, which is about four kilowatts per liter of fuel uh, power density. But the future target is to move to a single fuel cell stack, which is 500 horsepower or 370 kilowatts. And that's in our next generation of fuel cells. Now that's currently a design that's going into uh, production in our emerging factory in the USA. And that production uh, factory will have the capacity for 12,000 heavy duty fuel cells per annum. <clears throat> so from the end of next year onwards, we'll pr be producing much higher power density fuel cells and at a better uh, price point on a dollar per kilowatt basis because of the volume, the economies of scale that we'll get from that factory. And you'll start to see that coming into our vehicles uh, from 2023 onwards. So we carry still a lot of patents against our fuel cells and we do a lot of R&D in regards to that technology. <clears throat> However, we are also a collaborative integrator. By that, I mean, we don't build vehicles from the ground up. We work with existing OEMs who provide a cab chassis. So they've already got the maturity of understanding how a vehicle uh, is configured. But effectively what we do is work with them to provide a vehicle without any of the diesel powertrain on it. So no diesel motor or tanks. And then we replace that with the full fuel cell electric powertrain, which is the fuel cell, which is our proprietary technology. We ma marry that with then uh, a battery, uh, which helps with dynamic uh, power load balancing and we also put in the hydrogen gas storage, which gives the range for the vehicle. So the variation in terms of the amount of uh, hydrogen gas storage gives uh, the range for the vehicle, whether it's for urban locations or for long distances. We integrate then the electric motors uh, and other technologies. So there's a lot of software integration that goes into converting a vehicle so that the vehicle performance is married with the powertrain performance so you get optimal uh, outcomes. And because it's um, primarily electric vehicle, you get a lot of data from the vehicle. So there's a lot of telemetrics that come from the, um, the vehicle. So you're understanding temperatures, range, consumption, any issues in regards to service and maintenance that can be dealt with uh, in almost real time effectively. So that's our business model. And as um, the business also progresses over time, you'll see that technology will change as well. Materials will change. You'll see more composites coming into the vehicles. We've got uh, electric axle technology, which we'll bring into 
uh, replace existing drive shafts, et cetera, and give us more uh, space on the frame rails to put our packaging for gas storage. We spent a lot of time on the engineering and design before we actually put a vehicle into operation. And that engineering design ensures that we've got ADR compliance, that we're not exceeding axle loads, um, that we're achieving uh, payload requirements and achieving the range and performance that's required from the customer. So all of those elements go into combining uh, the vehicle and uh, its uh, ability to deliver uh, the outcomes that the customer's looking for. So as mentioned, we're working closely and, and looking forward to uh, participating in the Bundaberg uh, bio uh, hydrogen economy and through that providing our refuse trucks, which we're doing in collaboration with Superior Pack. So it'll be the first zero emission hydrogen powered uh, waste truck trial happening uh, in that location in, in Bundaberg, which is fantastic. As we've heard from Philip, uh, the supply, utilitas recarbon in producing hydrogen uh, from biogas and biomass sources, which is fantastic. We'll have vehicles available for operation from the middle of next year. Uh, there'll be uh, two of those, which will be your typical metropolitan uh, side lift loader um, compactor waste trucks uh, that uh, Superior Packet providing the bodies for. We'll provide the uh, hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle. And between us, we're working very collaboratively in terms of the engineering to ensure that there's full integration between weight distribution, engineering and software, et cetera. So it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for the Bundaberg area. And we see this as really being a showcase for other councils, other regions uh, to, to move ahead. And as Philip mentioned as well, there's a lot of biomass uh, uh, landfill type opportunities where biogas is available to convert to hydrogen and therefore close that ecosystem and bring waste trucks into that uh, equation. So the uh, collaboration with uh, Superior Pack, we're targeting uh, up to 20 uh, waste trucks, uh, potentially more, where there's a lot of interest uh, for these vehicles. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge uh, with the Superior Pack factory there in Bundaberg in terms of compact to build and design. Uh, the team has also been working on electric uh, vehicles, so they're very familiar with what it means to uh, convert their vehicles to electrified uh, power takeoffs. And through this, we'll see that that collaboration will go not just from Bundaberg through Queensland, but into other states. And uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, quite a lot of appetite for these vehicles, and we see it as a very core sector for the market and one that's uh, very achievable. We're very happy with the collaboration there with uh, Rob Rigley and the team. But further to that, uh, from 22 onwards, you'll see a lot more of uh, Hyazon's fuel cell electric vehicles on Australian roads. Uh, I'll just talk through some of these. Uh, top left is our prime mover. We term it a HiMax uh, 450, which is a 450 kilowatt electric motor. It's a, a six by four, uh, 70 ton prime mover. Now we rate it at 70 tons uh, GCM, but that depends on the terrain. So that same vehicle that we've sold into New Zealand, we derate to 58 tons simply because of the terrain. Uh, but it's, it's certainly also one that um, has the capacity to uh, provide really uh, B-double uh, equivalent performance. And the range on that vehicle is over 600 kilometres. It's got 65 kilograms of hydrogen gas storage on board. And uh, the power there is, is sufficient to, to get the, the range and duration. So those vehicles will be on the road in Australia from the middle of next year. Uh, two, for example, going to uh, Core Gas and Port Campbell uh, in New South Wales. Um, so top middle, you can see the garbage truck that uh, we've described. As I say, a lot of interest uh, across Australia for those vehicles. Top right is actually a photo of the vehicle before it left China. So I'll, I'll uh, clarify the prime mover is fully imported from uh, Europe. The uh, garbage truck we're actually doing uh, through integration here locally in Australia. We've got a Melbourne prototyping facility that we're working through for that one. The buses and coaches are fully imported currently from China, but we're looking at how we do more of that local integration here in Australia. So that photo top right is the vehicle before it left China. It's now currently sitting in Brisbane um, in Yatla, and it's the first of 10 that will be coming into Australia. So the balance of those vehicles will be here by year end and into next year, early next year, they'll be in operations uh, up in Christmas Creek in the, in the Pilbara. So quite a lot of design work went into those vehicles uh, because of their operation in, in gravel, dusty environments. 
Uh, the city bus, bottom right, um, is one that we'll bring in as a demonstrator in the middle of next year. Uh, your typical city bus, it has the gas storage on the roof, uh, whereas the gas storage in the coach is actually at the back compartment, the storage compartment. Uh, but with that, we'll uh, be able to at least demonstrate with uh, local operators and councils uh, the performance of these uh, fuel cell electric um, buses. And, and I believe they will become part of uh, combined fleets for different metro operations for fleet operators. The uh, bottom middle is the concrete agitator. Uh, that's a design we're working through at the moment. And we'll look to have uh, demonstration vehicles of those on the roads next year. And bottom left, you may have heard uh, the announcement with Arc Energy up in Townsville. We're building five road trains, uh, 140 ton GCM capacity. They're only short haul because we're only doing uh, from the refinery to the, uh, the port in Townsville. But with those, I'll demonstrate payload carrying capacity of fuel cell electric vehicles as part of the, the typical Sun Metals uh, operations in that location. And that knowledge that we'll build up from those demonstration vehicles will go into designing a long haul road train of the same carrying capacity, which will move uh, primary ore from Mount Isa down to uh, Townsville. So that's the challenge and part of the journey that we're on to bring these vehicles and others that we're looking at in terms of uh, types of platforms and vehicle configurations that are part of the uh, journey to zero emissions and, and decarbonizing uh, heavy duty fuel cell, uh, heavy duty vehicles, I should say, in Australia and also New Zealand. So as we said, and, and Bundaberg's key to this, and as Philip mentioned, it really is um, a case study in the opportunity that's available to decarbonize the uh, vehicle transportation industry. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, it's an opportunity I would like next time to be there physically in person to present and uh, look forward to meeting people uh, face to face in future. But uh, thank you for your time and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Please thank Dr. John Seaman from Hyzon. Now we're very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today. It's Dr. Zara Karim, Associate Professor, Mechanical Engineering, QUT. His primary research is directed towards solving acute food processing and preservation problems using advanced engineering methodologies. His high level achievements in both fundamental and applied research have established him as an emerging research leader in this field. He's published 213 refereed research publications, including 118 peer reviewed journals, five books and four patents. He is editor, board member of six reputed journals and supervisor of 26 past and current PhD students. He has won multiple international awards for his outstanding contributions and is the recipient of numerous national and international competitive grants totaling 3.2 million. His current research Lachlan, did that come through? Is drying, nanofluid, solar thermal storage, concentrating PV thermal collector and lean manufacturing. Please welcome Dr. Azaro Karim. from you. Okay, today I want to share some of the research works we are doing at QUT in the food sector and particularly uh, application of engineering knowledge in food and drying area. My dad was an agricultural scientist and in 1968 he got a fellowship to go to um, International Rice Research Institute in Philippines. This photo was taken that time. And um, his team has de de developed a new variety of rice uh, named as IRRI-10, which has high level of productivity and yield. And those varieties and subsequent research has significantly contributed towards um, the agricultural revolution in Bangladesh. So here's uh, left most is my dad. 
with their glasses. Again, this photo was taken in 1968 in Manila, Philippines. Assume Bangladesh, the size is just 8% of Queensland, 112, and population is 170 million. And they're still, the small country, big population is self-sufficient in food. Those research has contributed significantly. And we are, I have six brothers and sisters, and my dad wanted at least one of us study agriculture. And he has tons of books to utilize them. Uh, unfortunately, none of them studied agriculture. So when I studied, started engineering, I said, Dad, I'm studying engineering, but I still can work in agriculture. The engineers can work in that area. But I knew that, I'm just pleasing my dad, engineers hardly work in agriculture. Those are not attractive jobs, at least that time in Bangladesh. But during my master's in National University of Singapore and PhD in Melbourne University, I found that's the possibility. You can work, apply engineering knowledge in agriculture and actually significantly contribute in that area. So when I talk about engineering knowledge application in food, it's a little bit of emotional topic as well. Okay, so we all know value of food and the essential um, in our life, a lot of uh, nutritional component, healthy ingredients in food, and without food we cannot consider our life, and particularly hort horticultural products. And in Australia, is uh, food processing is the one of the largest industries, and annual turnover is about 131 billion with 15% employment directly or indi indirectly. <coughs> and uh, And horticultural products, as you know, this highly perishable. We cannot keep outside more than two days. And um, because it has about 80% water content. That's why it's very highly perishable. And in food chain, about 40% is wasted. This is data from, um, uh, from the UN. And we are not uh, much better. We are still uh, wasting a lot of food, probably not 40%. Some of the reasons are seasonality, uncertain demand, and lack of proper processing. And I'm sure you are not unfamiliar with this sort of uh, scenarios. And very recently, you know that we can buy avocado $1 dollar avocado is very cheap, but it's good for us, but not probably for the farmers. They're not get the, getting the right value. And when it's cheap, I buy 10 when I need to buy five, and actually four of them goes to the bin. So we are wasting in many ways. And waste doesn't mean the food going to the bin. Waste, if farmer getting one dollar while he deserves to get $3, it's also a waste of value. So we need to think about whether we can add value in these products. Is there any way you can save this? And when you talk about waste of food, it's not food is wasted. We are wasting energy, we're wasting land, we're wasting water, capital, and eventually we are contributing to the carbon emission. And if we can only save a quarter of this food wasted worldwide, we can feed about a billion hungry people in the world. So it's not only a science problem, it's a humanitarian problem as well. And where food is wasted? It wasted everywhere in the food chain, starting from the farm to the consumer. So you need to take steps everywhere how we can save this waste. There's many ways to address this problem. One of the best ways is drying. When it's overproduction, 
when you cannot preserve it properly, we can dry it. Then advantage of drying is easy to process and is long term preservation. No other process can preserve so long time. You can preserve up to 25 years, depending on the product and how do you dry it. And packaging, handling, transportation, everything is easy because you are losing 80% of weight and volume, not 80%, but you reduce some volume. But there are some challenges. What is the challenge? This is one of the most energy hungry process. Very energy intensive process. And 15% of total industrial energy usage goes to drying. And it takes a long time. One day to a few days, even a week. And during drying, particularly in traditional drying, we lost the quality of the food. Now, in the morning, Ian McKinnon has shown that this connection between food, water, and energy, you can see the connection here. So here's 80% water in the food, and you have a huge energy consumption. Can we work it out? Now, not only in food, drying is part of many industrial processes. Look at any industry, drying is there. And as I said, it's very energy hungry and time consuming. An example here in uh, timber industry, about 70% energy is used in drying and about 90% of the processing time. So if you can save some time, save some energy, it's a huge contribution and also huge contribution to minimize the energy, uh, sorry, carbon emission. And we talked about quality. In this image, you can see the leftmost is a fresh one. Of course, when you dry, when you process, you cannot have the fresh food quality, but you can try to get as close as possible to the fresh food. Here, five samples you can see, these are dried using different methods but same final moisture content. Final product is the same, and initial product is the same. So depending on the drying, you can get different quality. And worst is the right most image, which is convective drying, and this is the widely used our, in our industries. So we need to develop new methods of drying, new ways. Now, current research or research that have been done mostly empirically in nature, with trial and error, trial and error, uh, without understanding the fundamentals. What's happening inside the food when you dry it? What's happening to water? What water is that? And we need to know, when you study this, this we dry, develop mathematical models, and we need some properties. And this tra traditional research use unrealistic properties. When you have a properties, density, Diffusivity, for example, the initial most uh, sample is significantly changes during drying. Those are not taken into consideration. So we took a new approach. We thought, well, we try to understand the fundamentals. We develop a mathematical modeling, simulation, and experimental investigation using advanced methods, such as NMR, microscopy, and advanced imaging techniques. And we thought we develop I uh, need to study is from multi-scale perspective. We are coming to that multi-scale uh, matter. And if we summarize, and when you do develop mathematical modeling and multi-scale is a huge data we'll be dealing with. How to deal with this data? We want to use artificial intelligence or machine learning. So if we present, summarize all things in a graphical form, it will look like that. In left-hand side, you can see theoretical model. We mathematically understand the fundamentals. In right-hand side, experimentally understand the process, and we connect through artificial intelligence or machine learning. So as I said, we need to understand the fundamental of the water transport, how water is migrated during drying. Like if we don't, patient goes to a doctor, doctor must understand what's the problem of the patient, otherwise he cannot prescribe the medicine. 
So currently, we thought, well, there is a solid, there is some water, these are separated, but it's wrong. How it stays in the fluid? You can see that water and cells are not uniform. It's circular, rectangular, hexagonal, and different shapes, irregular shapes, irregu irregular size, and water is in the cells as intercellular water, intercellular water, and cell wall water. Why you need to know that? If you look at this image, when you free water, is transported or removed, no change takes place in the food. And current research considers that all the water is free water, like water in a bottle. It's not. If free water, you take out, no change in the, in the fluid, no quality deterioration. However, when you touch your intracellular water, first you experience cellular shrinkage and cellular damage. Cells are broken at some stage. And finally, the cell wall water, we usually don't touch it. It's when you dry it, still water is there, some water. We don't touch it because all nutrition values are gone if you touch the cell wall water. So now, how do we understand that? Now, we know the th three types of water. We need to know how much water is what type. There are no methods available to know that. So we try to develop a method to understand these water characteristics using some advanced imaging methods, which is usually used in medical science. For example, we use NMR to understand the water characteristics. I'm not going to details of this method. And here are some of the images from NMR, and also use microtomography tomography, or CT uh, tomography, X-ray microtomography. And with those, now we have some results here. We found, you can see you have investigated a lot of fruits and vegetables. Here is a summary, and you can see that only um, six to 16% water is free water. So, and most water is intracellular water, bound water. It's physically, chemically bonded. So you have to treat properly this chemical, physically bonded. When you take out, it affects the quality, affects the phytochemical, affects vitamin C, affects color. So you need to properly deal with those. And also there are some interesting connections between this water characteristics and, for example, porosity, another important characteristics of food. More interestingly, we found that when you dry food, fruits and vegetables particularly, these cells are broken at different stages. This is a new knowledge, not available in the literature. You can see this, uh, the values in the graph, different color means different Temperature, you can see in the right hand side, 45 degrees, 60 and 70 degrees. And each valley means a set of cells are broken. And finally, we dry it. But if you dry at low temperature, 45 degrees, there's no cells is broken. It's very slow drying, but it takes a long time. So what is the balance? And what is the proof? We did some microtomography experiments. You can see this at different stages, cells are broken. So it supports what we found in the previous slides. Now, we have seen that all the changes takes place in the cells. But so far, no or minimum research has considered those. They all have considered bulk level. I have a sample, I dry, add temperature, heat, take out the water. Don't know much about what's happening inside we thought probably we have to take the right approach starting from the cells. And we call it multi-scale approach. So we start from the left-hand side cells. We take the NMR image, model it. I'm not going to the details of the mathematics or model. Uh, and connect that to the sample and connect to the dryer. That's how we can understand the entire process. If we know the fundamentals, then we can apply right method to dry them. And uh, when you consider multi-scale approach, it's a 
first of all, you have to represent a domain. Um, this left hand side, there's a lot of complexity in representing that in the model. And then you have to have a framework and how do you connect them? A lot of complexities. And so I'm not going to those details. So based on this fundamental knowledge, we have developed a new drying method involving microwave and convective. So we call it intermittent microwave convective drying. And this is um, under patent application now. So what we found from that? <coughs> if you look at this graph, top left-hand side, the blue one is uh, convective. And we started drying at five. Five means five proportion of water and one is uh, dry material. After 160 minutes, still not 25% dried in convective, but in microwave or IMCD, already dried. So we have found that we can save about 80% time. So when you say time, you're saving energy as well. We have seen a lot of discussion in renewable energy, net zero. Most focus has been on generating the renewable energy, generating the green energy, but less focus on saving the energy. Say, if I use 100 kilowatt hour of energy, and if I can save 50%, 50 kilowatt hour, I'm already reducing 50% of carbon emission without having single kilowatt hour of renewable energy. So you need to work in both areas. On one hand, you have to improve the energy efficiency in the existing system. On the other hand, you have to generate green energy. So if you can save energy in, in drying, so it helps achieving the net zero target. On the other hand, in the morning, Ian talked about huge volume of water for hydrogen energy, and it's a waste. In food, as I said, 80% is water. If you dry them, you get a lot of water. If you can collect them, capture them, then that can help your hydrogen generation as well. In terms of quality, you can see that in, uh, in the bottom two graphs, and all microwave drying have higher quality than convective. So you're achieving higher quality, higher energy efficiency, and less time. And this one you have seen before. So all, so this is PR1, 1, PR2, 1, 2, PR1, 3. These are ratio between microwave and convective. So turn on and off, on and off. This is the ratio. So we have to work out that one as well to optimize the process. And when you know the fundamentals, there's some, you can challenge some existing myths. For example, in People have a myth that is uh, uh, freeze drying is the best. And for pharmaceuticals and this niche products, we all usually use um, um, freeze drying. It's a very lengthy process and it takes a lot of energy and time. However, our study shows that you can have better color, but not other quality. So with our microwave, which saves 80% time, you can achieve comparable quality. Now, if you have this knowledge, you can apply in different areas, developing innovative new food products. I am, I'll show a couple of examples here. So we talked to a lot of um, farmers in, the, in Queensland and found that this banana bell, of course, is a wasted, we uh, chop it off and uh, live in the ground. However, have we ever thought that it could be a source of a lot of, lot of medicinal qualities, health, health beneficial uh, compounds, active compounds, bioactive compounds, and so on? So we are working on using these to develop a lot of innovative new products. I have one example here, banana blossom tea, the tea bag. 
you can try, good taste, and a lot of health benefits. We have a stall outside, table, so you can have a look. And um, banana blossom tea, it will be interesting. We have a Bandarbag banana blossom tea. B, triple B tea, one day. <laughs> and uh, another example here, uh, we use cassava to extract starch from this uh, um, cassava. And in the industries, the peel and the bagasse will throw away. And um, it's not much in Australia. We collected some samples from Thailand, and we found that the stuff you throw away, the cassava peel and the bagasse, still have a lot of starch in comparable to even cassava itself. So we still have a lot of starch, which can be used um, developing, for example, um, biodegradable uh, food packaging. So you can see that if you get the fundamental knowledge, we can have, have used this otherwise wasted materials to a valuable food product. And we are lagging a little bit behind in that area. A couple of years ago, I went to Japan for a conference, and I found that a lot of varieties of uh, products they get from food, waste food. I don't know the name of this, any of the things, but here are a few samples. So we should strive to use our food or wasted food to make innovative new products. So based on our group's um, work, here are some of the achievements I think has been mentioned. Uh, we have published four, five books actually. So there's a lot of uh, things we have doing can be found in these books. And here is my team. Um, most, most of my PhD students and research fellows. And um, if you can go to our website, you can see that a lot of academics are involved. And here is a reference from Australian Research Council the reviewer. So we got a ARC linkage grant recently. So here's a testimony to our group. And council found that we are one of the best team probably in the world. Um, in this research area. And uh, we have a flyer. You can see in there one of the desks. And you can see what we do, what we can do, our capabilities. We're happy to work with you. We need partners. For example, this one, we are at initial stage. But we need partners to go to the production level, industry level. And here is one of our innovative new dryers we are working on. So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm your, uh, your stand-in MC just for, for this session, so don't, don't worry. Trisha will be back soon. <laughs> um, Firstly, thank you, Azara, for that great presentation. It was a really, really interesting opportunity for our re region. Uh, the, the waste opportunity is a great one um, for, for, for Bundaberg. Also really interested in, in the, the drying stuff and seeing that um, kiwi fruit break down over time. It sort of, I guess, reminds me of some of my own research in this area that I've done um, <coughs> with kids' lunch, lunch boxes on day one of the term when you open up and you see the kiwi fruit there from last year. And um, I haven't presented papers on it, but... Um, I've um, had to buy a lot of new lunch boxes so I can forward that, that research through the university, that helps. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, I just want to uh, remind you of Sli Slido. Uh, if you've got any questions for our speakers, please feel free to, to go to Slido, it's going to be on the screen at the moment, uh, for any uh, uh, questions from our panel members, uh, which will be up, be up in a moment. <coughs> so our next speaker um, is Fiona Waterhouse, CEO of Ut Utilitas Group. Uh, Fiona is a production engineer by trade, but before this she has had, an, had another life as, a, as an athlete. She was a member of the Australian Pentof Pentathlon team. Uh, she's also a silver medalist at the Commonwealth Games and uh, was a pioneer in the early days of triathlon in Australia. But when she realised that wasn't hard enough uh, as a career, she thought she'd do something really, really tough um, and get into developing biohubs across Australia. Um, in 2010, she founded the, the Utilitas Group, which is... Um, 
charter is to bring together the most capable and motivated people on the planet to unleash the power of fire, gas and decarbonise industry, support energy networks and energise communities. Uh, she's got a long uh, uh, rap sheet here, which I, I actually won't go through because she speaks better than I'm going to be able to introduce her. Um, and I'll call Vienna to come up and, and tell us about the Bundaberg Biohub and give us a bit of an update. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. A good introduction. And um, what you don't know is Ben is actually a much better athlete than me. He was a professional triathlete for 15 years, so we're going to trade mm. outings of um, <laughs> sporting prowess. <laughs> So I definitely wouldn't take you on right now, Ben, promise. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and I uh, want to acknowledge the traditional owners. We're very grateful um, for the knowledge that we've um, gained from Indigenous people about how to care for country, and it's certainly a big part of the utilitas ethos as we step forward and build 100 biohubs around Australia um, in the next 10 years. Uh, the, the photo there uh, is Jack and I last year when we launched uh, at this event uh, the Bundaberg Biohub, which was really relaunching the Bundaberg East Wastewater Treatment Plant into the Bundaberg Biohub as a next generation industrial park. And we've heard today a lot of stories about the importance of food and fuel and water and energy and how all of these things uh, are coming together in, in the circular economy and the bioeconomy. And I guess the Bundaberg Biohub is the physical, um, uh, large-scale commercial demonstration of that. And so we are now one year into the redevelopment of the site and um, I'm going to talk you through a bit of an update. But one of the things I just want to point out is really this is about uh, action, traction, decision making and investment and we utilitas would not have gotten any ways to the 11 year journey we're in if it hadn't have been for the Bundaberg Regional Council because it took us six years to transact the sale of the uh, former Bundaberg East wastewater treatment plant and that happened because there was vision there was commitment every hurdle we faced it had never been done before Every hurdle we face, both the council and the, and the staff in the council just held hands and stepped over every bump. And I think that is a real articulation and it shows the quality and the character of Bundaberg and Wide Bay region and what makes this place so great and so special. So we're smiling. We were smiling a year ago and we're still smiling. Um, so Utilitas Group, we uh, develop projects that turn waste into net zero energy jobs and value. And um, there's an, a saying that um, I was once uh, draw, had my attention drawn to uh, that came from a, a psychoanalyst in the 1700s, believe it or not, uh, Dr. Arthur Schupenheuer. And he said, all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed, then it's rejected, and in brackets, violently, sometimes. Uh, and then it's accepted as being self-evident. And I think that's where net zero is at right now. Uh, I think in 2010, when I launched uh, Utilitas at All Energy Week in Melbourne and was talking about building 100 biohubs in 100 regional communities, roughly 10 petajoules of energy or 100 megawatts electrical equivalent, uh, I think in distributed regional uh, local place-based um, bioenergy facilities, I think everyone thought uh, we were barking mad, basically. And I think it's only now that this, the, the understanding of really what it means to be net zero and just what a big ask that is, particularly for Australia, but just what a massive opportunity that is for regional Australia. I think that aha moment is really happening now and it's very, very exciting to watch as these moments and the presentations we've seen this morning really articulate just the immense opportunity this is for Region Australia. So it's very exciting and we're glad to be right in the middle of it. Uh, so we do two things and I guess really all we wanted to do was to deploy uh, commercial scale anaerobic digestion. 
in Australia. There's 12,500 uh, commercial anaerobic digesters just in Germany, to put it in perspective. And yet there's only about a handful of really advanced anaerobic digesters in Australia and um, about 200, half of which are landfill gas and some in sewage treatment. So we're down in the hundreds, Germany's at 12,500. When you look at that, we're, we've really got a big opportunity in closing that gap. Uh, it's considered to be about 371 uh, petajoules a year of energy opportunity, which is about 9% of our energy mix is what biogas should be in the future. Uh, and that's consistent with what it is in Germany. And so we've got all of that as an immense opportunity to catch up. And really, Utilitas just wanted to go out and deploy biogas plants and get feedstock in and make gas and upgrade it and inject it into the gas network. Um, simple, you might think, but actually, in order to do that, we've had to become an industrial park developer and find sites where we could actually pull these projects together. We could then co-locate tenants that have synergistic uh, waste streams or energy offtakes um, or byproduct offtakes in order to really be able to prove this as an asset class in Australia. So our, our novel uh, business model, if you like, for deploying green gas infrastructure is to build them within our own industrial parks. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's been seven years uh, working with uh, Bundaberg Regional Council to give effect to the first biohub, uh, which we launched last year. And I guess that it was a fairly monumental achievement to take a municipal wastewater treatment plant to retire it and turn it into a next generational um, industrial park. They'd never been done before. There's 678 wastewater treatment plants in Australia and 60% of those are the same age as the Bundaberg East wastewater treatment plant that's now retired. So built in the 1930s to 1980s. Uh, so most of our fleet of sewage treatment plants in Australia is in fact actually very old and um, also very small. And so there is an immense opportunity we heard from, um, from John from Heizun and from Philip from Recarbon about the opportunity to repurpose wastewater treatment plants and augment wastewater treatment plants, active ones, uh, to produce um, more biogas and to turn that biogas into hydrogen. Immense opportunity to repurpose that fleet. And I guess we really see that the role that the Bundaberg Council have played in the water industry and in being able to show the transition of a retired plant to something new is very important. I think the fact that we created uh, together this uh, annual event and it's now become a perpetual event, which I think is quite amazing, the, uh, the uh, hydrogen, the biohydrogen industry cluster supply chain cluster is again similarly something that has emerged from this project and this has really been seven years, no grants, we just held hands and stepped through shared cost, shared risk and I guess what it shows is a quite a different approach to a public-private partnership to get things done and I think that's the kind of change, that's the kind of collaboration, that's the kind of uh, thinking outside the box to work together between government and industry to actually deliver something new. And I think one of the key things that makes Bundaberg so special and the council and the council staff so special in their motivation and their passion is also their absolute commitment to driving investment into this, re into this region. And everything they do, everything that they say is all talking about making it easy for people to make investment decisions, to come to base a business here, to form a partnership, to team up with a local company, to get involved in the local community. That is a very active and proactive part of Bundaberg and the broader region. And I think it's very important, their investment um, prospectus, which you've got on your table, is again another indication of a a next generation level of thinking about how to bring people together and how to bring people 
to the region and what benefits there are and how to connect people to the information about waste streams or the information about energy off-takers or the information about, um, you know, companies like Superior Pack who make the waste trucks. Those kinds of connections come because you've got an active group that really are absolutely passionate and dedicated to connecting the people in their community to each other and to outside people to, to drive investment, to drive jobs, to drive economic activity in this region. So the Bundaberg Biohub, which you will get the opportunity to go and visit this afternoon, it's very exciting. Uh, it's nine and a half acres. Uh, as I said, it was uh, first commissioned in 1944. It's a, 50 it's a former 50,000 equivalent person sewage treatment plant. So you will see the normal uh, kinds of um, technologies that are clumped together in a, a typical sewage treatment plant in this facility. Um, we focused uh, last year on uh, preparing the site to attract head tenancies uh, and you will see that we've cleared uh, the northern end of the site completely and that is now getting ready for the data centre and the guys from Andy's here somewhere, I think he was here, um, the guys from the data centre to put their data centre in. Um, the the other things that we have done in the last year, aside from carrying out some demolition and preparing the site for the tenancies, is we have managed to attract to the region Smart Capital Group as a, a, a property development, uh, industrial park development, commercial uh, property development company and Ethical Development Fund of Australia, which is a wholesale fund that funds green infrastructure, sustainable developments and um, real estate like the Bundaberg Biohub. So that's phenomenal. Already this has attracted some tens of millions of dollars now of investment and these new um, economic development partners to the region. And we are now in the process, or they are now really now leading the process of redeveloping the site into a five tenancy. So tenancy one, is the visitor's centre and the laboratories. There's already two laboratories on the site. The Bundaberg Regional Council have their NADA accredited water services laboratory. They're already a tenant on the site. We used to lease our lab, which is the lab next door off them. And then when we bought the site, they now lease uh, their laboratory off us. Uh, so there's two, two laboratories on site. There's a pilot plant, which Dr. Prasad Kippadu one of the world's experts in biogas uh, is going to be utilising, he's from Griffith University, they're going to be utilising our pilot plant over the next three years to run some, um, some trials on uh, some digestates and looking at um, uh, the replacing chemical fertilisers with biological alternatives. So that's going to be a very exciting thing. And, and so the, the laboratories and the visitor's centre, we're, uh, we're building a visitor's centre by Nevhouse, Nev House is an Australian company that has pioneered using waste plastic in building products. And we're going to put, uh, they, they use uh, Nev Houses, uh, they've built in remote communities uh, in, um, in the Pacific. They're very cyclone resistant, they're very quick to put up, and they're made out of recycled plastic. So very, very exciting that we're going to have an example, Nev House as our visitor's centre. Uh, Utilitas has also made a commitment that on each of our 100 sites, we will have a Nev House first as the site construction um, facility, and then it'll evolve into our on-site laboratory and visitor's centre um, as, the, as the asset comes into its life. So we're a very big supporter of Nev House and we think their technology is going to revolutionise um, building. Uh, tenancy two is the, you heard uh, Philip from ReCarbon. Uh, we teamed up with ReCarbon a bit over a year ago, thanks to Dr. Ian Kennan, who introduced us. And we're, uh, we will be, um, building out tenancy two will be the biogas plant taking local uh, crop residuals and, and uh, lightly packaged supermarket waste out of 
the waste streams in the community will be digesting it in our two big digesters. You'll see when we get out onto site that we're actually repurposing two old aerators from the wastewater treatment plant into two new digesters. So we're actually using some Canadian technology called Octiform, which has been used 400 times in biodigesters in Germany. And so we'll be pioneering in Australia using it to repurpose existing uh, wastewater treatment infrastructure to become uh, next generation advanced anaerobic digesters. So you'll, you'll be able to see where we're, we're going to be doing that. And then we'll have uh, the recarbon unit, which Philip explained, uh, the microwave plasma conversion unit that will make the hydrogen. Then we'll have the Haskell refueling station and the council will be refueling their new Hyzorn and superior packed waste trucks with, um, with the hydrogen from that facility. So a full, a full loop, um, which is very, very exciting. Uh, in tenancy three, which is a lot of the, the drying beds, which are down near the river, it's a big um, oxidation ditch. You'll know it when you see it. We'll be standing up on it, looking over the site. Um, some people have suggested we should put it forward as a trial place for the um, Olympics in 2032, maybe for the um, rowing or something. It does quite blow your mind um, that this was part of a sewage treatment plan and it was used to aerate sewage because uh, it is a very, very big tank. I wouldn't want to be paying to demolish it, considering how much it cost us to demolish just four small tanks on the site. Um, I would not be lining up to pay someone to demolish it. Um, but when you see it, it is magnificent. And the team um, from Wide Bay Pacific will be utilising it to grow al algae and um, for aquaculture and agriculture. And that's very exciting. They'll be utilising uh, some of the waste heat that you heard uh, Philip mentioned from Recarbon, the Recarbon process is exothermic, so there's, uh, there's waste heat available from that facility. It will heat digesters, but it will also play a role in warming tanks and things for the agricultural facility, as well as providing some CO2, food grade CO2, to promote um, the growth of the algae and shorten the production timeline. Um, so we're very excited to have um, Malcolm and Clive from um, Wide Bay Pacific as part of the tenancies for um, the Bundaberg Biohub. And you'll hear more from them out on site later. Uh, on tenancy four, we will have a yield 3D waste to energy plant, a small package scale, 50 tonne a day at 50% moisture content, uh, waste to energy facility. It will be taking local waste agricultural plastics. Agricultural plastics is a significant issue for this region and um, it'll be, it'll be uh, high temperature pyrolysis, so we'll be pyrolyzing uh, the waste plastic, some, the solid phase digestate from our uh, anaerobic digester, and it will take also some uh, green waste and potentially some uh, textile waste from the, uh, and diverting it away from the local landfill. And the energy from that facility will go to power reliable green power to um, the CAS data center. So what you can see is there's a full chain of connectivity between the tenancies where one tenant um, is, is deriving some form of input from the previous tenancy and, and all supported by having world-class laboratory capability and world-class QUT, Griffith and other universities that we're actively engaged with um, around innovation and what's coming next in terms of all of these innovations. So this is really designed to be um, the scale-up version of what Ian has at, uh, in, at QUT, the, his, his um, pilot scale facility, fully automated, able to make its own um, decisions about production processes to optimise um, what gets produced, it's really basically a giant version of that at commercial scale and you'll see it unfolding. And in terms of um, attracting investment, it's already now attracted some tens of millions of dollars worth of investment um, and by the time all 
five tenancies are fully built out, it'll be just shy of $100 million of investment that will be drawn into uh, the community to create these new jobs, new energy, new products. And I think that's not a bad effort for a retired sewage treatment plant. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thanks, Fiona. I won't do any more jokes, so don't, don't get worried. Um, first, I just want to recommend go to the Biohub uh, tour of the set this afternoon. You'll be able to see what, was, what you've just seen presented. The, the, having five tenancies is great. That's real investment. It's real stuff mobilising and, and occurring in, at the hub. Um, so really excited by, by that. Um, just as a bit of back on that, that um, wastewater treatment plant would have cost council the rate payers in excess of a million dollars to, to make a safe port down, you know, make the land and redevelop the land into a park or a piece of industrial land going forward. So there's, there's a lot of win-wins in this project and now it's, it's a great e economic opportunity for, for our region. Uh, so I'll just introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Rowan Orford, uh, who's a growing technical manager for Macadamia's Australia who's responsible for fo fostering sustainable innovation and sharing new insights and ideas to benefit our growers in the region. He previously worked as a technical advisor for South African Macadamia Processing Cooperative, the Mayo Max. Uh, during his four years with them, he was responsible for enhancing the performance and sustainability of 150 growers representing 6,000 hectares of potential trees. Uh, so a significant background uh, in this area and re relevant to our region. So I will ask Rowan, uh, if he's still here, to come and talk. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. I'm going to see if I can take this off just to... Does it still work? Okay, good. Um, yeah, firstly, I'm, I'm just uh, quite honored to have been invited. Um, I think I sort of snuck in by mistake, but anyway, I'll take it while I can. Um, and yes, thank you for the organizers. Um, it's a wonderful uh, experience for me. Um, it's also uh, the bioeconomy subject is, I have a, a background as a, an agroecologist but uh, in itself is quite an interesting sort of lens to look at the whole sort of system in itself. So it's also been a learning process for me. So if I present something that everybody is very aware of, just bear, uh, bear with me because it's me learning as I go. <laughs> um, but essentially, <clears throat> what Macadam is Australia, I will sort of present is... Uh, I've called the presentation an emerging bioeconomy. I think the, the term bioeconomy is something that is never a complete project. It's always something that we are working towards. Um, and the technology that comes with that development um, is always progressing. So I'm going to read this. This, this was done fairly sort of carefully, so I don't want to waste uh, the time to put it, uh, to express our sort of positioning, um, and it'll give you a bit of background as to Macadamia's Australia and what we do. So we stand for like-minded people, consumers, growers, retailers, distributors, and wholesalers, so we're trying to sort of um, work with all the whole supply chain with an interest in quality food and in provenance. So that's something that we pride ourselves on, um, is the fact that all the macadamias that we produce and we um, gather to our processing facility are all within, come from the Wide Bay area. Um, and we've, Macadamias Australia is an established multi-generational family-owned grower, processor, and marketer of the highest quality. So the Steinart family, they were previously uh, tomato growers, cut their teeth on, on the tough crop, and uh, then took all of those learnings from the tomato or small crop industry and have applied that to macadamias, which has given them kind of an attention to detail, which has made them fairly successful going forward into the macadamias. Um, and 
essentially the, the single origin macadamia nuts and macadamia products that we produce. We develop with innovative, high quality, premium macadamia nut products, then grow and personally source from optimal raw nut uh, required to make these products from a select group of grower families who share commitment to high quality. So that part is obviously an overview of the business, but what's key is sustainable and socially responsible farming practices, which essentially is, is in some ways considered a bioeconomy kind of approach. Um, many people do this just for marketing and branding. Many people say it is just paying lip service to the current trends and what's uh, sort of topical, but uh, Macadamia's Australia don't. And I'm, and I'm not saying that because I have the shirt and I, you know, but they really don't. They've got a key, a key ethical ambition to fulfill that. So the bioeconomy in terms of what it stands for, it's a very broad subject. I think it's quite gray in many areas. I'm not going to go through every single one, but essentially if you look at all of these statements, increase agricultural or biomass output, and on the other hand, sort of looking at resource efficient use, uh, integrating ourselves with the ecosystem, biodiversity, climate change, CO2, um, capture, systems thinking. I'm just saying words that I know sort of roughly all link up. But the point is that for us, we have to run a commercial business. We've got a commitment to a whole range of sort of uh, partners, but at the same time, we've got to do that in the context of the sustainable place we work in, the biodiversity that we belong to. Uh, we are not independent of nature. We, we suckle from it and it needs, we need to work with it, which is a, a change in how it used to be uh, done. So there's a very interesting book written by a lady called Kate Hayworth, I think I said it right, Hayworth, uh, um, Rayworth, sorry. And she's uh, an Oxford uh, trained economist. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this sort of new way of looking at economics. It's called donut economics. And essentially, it's considering the social and ethical, uh, social, ethical, and then environmental boundaries or ecological boundaries. And her idea. I've gone one. So the idea is that we try and stay within the donut. And we, Australia, if you look over here on these two axes, biophysical boundaries transgressed or social thresholds achieved, Australia can be very proud and it sits with an illustrious cluster in terms of the um, social thresholds achieved. But unfortunately, and it's not just, it's a whole crew, we have not paid attention to the biophysical boundaries that have been transgressed. So as a whole developed world, we all now have, an, a, com have a commitment to draw back some of these um, ecological ceilings that we've uh, broken. And um, that's, I suppose, what we're all here for. And that's just the overall picture, and that's how I sort of understand the bioeconomy in a certain context, and it's a very interesting way to apply a model. I think in Holland, they have now taken certain cities have taken that approach completely. So just from an agricultural point of view, <coughs> in a regional perspective, we've got a couple of sensitivities or, or agricultural issues and sensitivities. There are more, but I... I just wrote a few down. So water is very topical for us. We've just had a drought, and my company and my job depend on water. So if I don't have water, we don't have a company. Our investment basically goes down the drain. So, and we ride a very tight knife edge on that. This area gets a lot of rain, but the rain doesn't come consistently. Um, CO2 is very topical because we don't get rain consistently because We've got too much CO2 in the atmosphere um, and other gases, but, you know, so that's something that we uh, consider. Biodiversity is, if we lose our bees, uh, if we lose some of the um, 
ecological services, as an agricultural business, again, my job won't last very long. Our business won't last very long. And that's just, you know, you, you can flog the soil only so long till, till she doesn't give back anymore. So, and then land degradation, that's hand in hand, you know. So, and the biodiversity is also below ground. That was always forgotten. It was the unseen. It was part of the iceberg that was never looked at. But below ground biodiversity is probably one of the, it's like your gut biome. Suddenly people have realized that, you know, the microbial activity in your stomach and in the soil are actually sort of probably one of the more fundamental processes on this planet. And then we've got regional sensitivities. You've got the barrier reef. I think everybody knows about that. Climate change, I'm just touching on that here regionally. Australia's had a rough ride in the last uh, couple of years with the bushfires and the heat and the droughts. So I think no place on earth is aware of it as much as this. Bees and biodiversity, I've kept bees separate because even though they're part of biodiversity, they're specifically topical. And macadamias will yield 1% of their total crop without cross-pollination. So you might as well chuck it down the drain. So we need the bees. We've got two native bees in, Austra uh, in Queensland, and we've got the, uh, the European honeybee. Uh, salinity, soil salinity, COVID, food waste. We're very fortunate with COVID that it hasn't knocked the market too badly, but uh, did have some impact. Food waste, uh, Dr. Kareem, it would be nice to chat. I'll chat to you, maybe. Uh, Macadamia is fortunate you've got a long shelf life, so uh, we can probably uh, not waste as, many as, uh, as much as other crops. Uh, health, we're a, we're a great health product, but health is always something that's fundamental. Heart disease um, and all of that is is part of uh, the diet issues, and macadamias fit nicely into that, and labor shortages um, amongst others. So I've sort of touched on all of that. I'm going to give you sort of a very basic outline. It's a large topic because we have three different parts to our business. So we've got the farm, which was majority of the trees, about f over 400 hectares were planted over 15 years ago. So we've got that, and then we've expanded to about 700 plus hectares. And we've just recently commissioned our factory, which processes our nuts. And we are very, uh, it's a nice little fact that we only have a footprint of 25 kilometers between the processor and, and the farm. Uh, that's all here in uh, Bundaberg. And then we have our retail, uh, sorry, we've got our agri um, tourism side, which is also part of the, the the processing facility, and then obviously there's the retail side with the logistics. So essentially the trees produce the nuts for the factory, we process them into value-added products, and then that goes into the retail space and some goes into the agri-tourism side. So we have a lot of inputs um, on the farm, fuel, electricity, chemicals, fertilizer, irrigation, and compost or mulch, and I also have IPM there because we buy in a lot of bugs so we're quite proud in the sense that we are doing integrated pest management. Um, one of the issues that face the macadamia industry and, and all agricultural industries is that chemicals are getting removed off the list that were, can be used to control certain pests. And everybody's very against the pest control, but without certain chemicals, you can't have a commercially viable business. So we drop a yield or quality of product by 60 or 80 percent in some cases if there's no control. So we have to have those chemicals, but with IPM, if we can transition slowly into sort of um, biological control systems or, or, for example, wasps, that's something that we're very uh, active at. We've uh, also looking quite seriously now with a new plant in terms of integrating a whole bunch of systems into the plant to minimize our, our waste outputs. So moving on to that, the farm itself has got its own waste where we've got erosion, leachate, chemical residues, and we produce our own CO2. But I can tell you we're about to, uh, with company Carbon Friendly, about to prove that our farm is carbon negative. The next phase is to integrate the factory and we're hoping that we will come out as slightly negative to neutral. So that's something that we are 
looking at. We've got a native tree species from, the, from, from Queensland that sucks up a whole lot of CO2 and it is in our interest to pump more CO2 into the soil as sequestered organic matter or organic carbon because that has got positive benefits to yield. So we are a very strong carbon sink. Um, and we've knocked out erosion, leachate, and we've eliminated our chemical residues with a range of methods and monitoring, but also just tight management. So we don't do five or six weak punches. We, we do one punch with, for example, pest control, and, and it's a knockout punch because our machines are maintained. We, uh, we execute with everything highly calibrated, so I think that's something that also is forgotten, as everybody's looking at new technologies all the time, but actually just following the right procedures and maintaining your system, you can cut out a large number of, of uh, waste streams. Um, it's just looking at, at, at becoming more efficient. Um, and then, obviously, our factory has got its own waste, but, but we also are focusing a lot on the recycled side of the business, um, the biodigester side is very interesting for us because it's uh, possibly with the other side of the business something we can look at. Then we are very proud in terms of energy, and I suppose I've got to mention energy somewhere in this presentation. We take a lot of our shell and we burn the shell to reheat our water and the air that we use for drying. So that's where uh, the drying side of the uh, discussion we had earlier is very interesting to us because it takes a lot of energy. And then a lot of our shell husk, uh, the CO2 that we produce, the recycled wastewater, and some of the organic waste all goes back to the farm. So it's as closed as we can get at the moment, and we're looking out to, to knock out all of the other aspects where we can do better. We've fully committed to certification in terms of like Hort 360 and Fresh Care Environmental, and those are all the things that we're trying to, to, to show um, and to adhere to those kind of um, um, audit processes to make sure that we're achieving what we want. And ultimately, not to forget that this story is much as much uh, about positive feedback into the market. Um, that gives us a slight competitive edge, and, and the consumer, we want to honestly um, communicate that we're making those efforts to, to try and achieve what they are looking for in a product, and that's to be sustainable. Um, and I th think there's one more slide. I'm going not to be too long. So I think in, in summary, and I sort of captured three pictures, sustainable and se uh, sensible commercial balance. So we've got, and this is something that also has to be recognized, I think is we've got the young, conscientious consumer and since COVID, everybody's had a bit of time to look at their position in the world and recognize that there's certain values that they were probably ignoring in the rat race. And now that they had some downtime, like lockdown, to reassess themselves, they've gone into the consumer space once again and said, how can I make an impact? How can I vote with my dollar? And that's something that we've got to recognize. And, and it's a powerful force. And it's a force that the consumer doesn't really often acknowledge themselves is that we will jump as high and as far as they want us to jump to get their dollar. So it's all hand in hand with that process. Um, and the sequence between the processing and then back to the nut and working with our ecosystem around us, I don't think we, we can take another route. We have to follow that route. It doesn't make commercial sense or in a sustainable sense not to. So that's really in a very veneer, quick summary of what we do. And yeah, thank you very much. That's a picture of our soil that we've regenerated. Well, thanks, Rowan, for that another great presentation. Um, Anybody that does know Macadamia's Australia or the Steinhardt family know that they are a value-based organisation and have a strong commitment to sustainability and, and the region um, in the way they've conducted their business and one of the reasons why they've been such an, a success uh, in Bundaberg for several generations now. I think it's, uh, it's up to generation number three. 
Uh, so I'll now I want to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Stuart Parry, who's the director of uh, Sword and Stone. Uh, Stuart Parry is an internationally experienced executive, lecturer and chartered accountant with a depth of experience across a wide range of public sector and commercial areas including finance, procurement, risk management, uh, advisory and strategy. He's worked as an executive across funds management, financial management and financial accounting in Australia, the US and the UK. Prior to establishing his own consultancy, Stuart worked as a chartered accountant with leading global firms including EY, uh, Wilhelm's Investment and Brookfield's Asset, Asset Management. So I'll ask uh, Stuart uh, to come and uh, speak to us about um, their role in the bioeconomy. Thank you. Oh, he's zooming in. Yep. Hey Stuart, you there? Yeah, I am. Thanks, Malcolm. Wonderful. Okie dokie. I'm just going to get you through to the live stream now. I'm just going to share the content. Can you just tell me to make sure it's come up properly before we do that? Yep. Can you see that? Uh, I can. Is it just the um, just the presentation, or is my whole screen? Uh, looks to be just the Adobe window you've got open. Perfect. That's all I need. I don't know how to get it to a full one, so I'm just going to leave it like that. No, it's not a drama. I'll just pop it through now. Thank you. All right, should be all good to go. Perfect. Are we live, Malcolm? Yep, I'll just get you up on screen. Thank you. Just tell me when the. Uh, may I be introduced or? Yes, yes, you have been. I will hear. Ready when you are. Ready to go. Okay, Lachlan, ready to go? Live? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're up now. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is well. I hope you're enjoying the presentations today. Apologies for not being able to appear live. Um, we're going through a transaction which um, is taking up most of my time, so I do apologize for that. Um, my name is Stuart Parry. I'm from Sword and Stone Capital Management. We are a um, group of interested energy investors who are looking to commercialise new energy um, transition type products and developing the Australian grid. One of our investments is Energy Storage Solutions Asia Pacific, which is a new entity which we're setting up here in Australia. I'd like to talk to you that from our view of... Um, how we, we approach the sustainability of the products and how that we work within not only um, not only within environmental but also economic and social sustainability. Um, I find this a very good uh, quote. It's enabling technology. Um, energy storage is not going to be the only solution for anything. Um, there are lots of different ways that we're going to decarbonise the grid. However, without storage, be it um, different types of battery, different um, hydrogen pump storage, pumped hydro storage, we're not going to increase take up of renewables. Um, so therefore, we're looking at new ways to be able to do that. A little bit about us. So, any storage solutions, basic a team to support the early transition. Uh, Mixture, I'm from an um, uh, investment finance background. I have um, X tier one gen tail operators, um, XQEC, um, and also manufacturing um, and OMM. Um, one of my business partners runs a um, OMM company which uh, manages the solar and um, well, uh, commercial and industrial solar up and down the grid. Uh, we're looking to build a factory in Maryborough, and we're very close to announcement on that. 
and then moving up thereafter per um, Townsville. We'll manufacture to meet Australian for the current um, off-takers that we're negotiating with New Zealand, the Pacific and Southeast Asian demand. A key focus is working within regions, looking for regional employment and procurement. Um, before I talk about the technology, I just want to talk a little bit about sustainability because it's a little bit of a loaded topic at this moment. Sustainability has been increasingly in focus. Now, what we hear a lot about is um, environmental sustainability, but there is also economic and social um, sustainability that we really need to factor into any type of investment that we make. But currently, the EU and US, they are proposing taxes on imports, So there, and there's greater transparency requirements through, through stock exchanges, shareholders, and also the general um, environment. And this is just, this is just not going away. The, the, this is the, re the reality that we have to work within moving forward. Um, like I said, we're all very well versed on environmental, but economic sustainability is really, really important. It, it's making sure that people aren't left behind. I have a view that we don't want an Appalachia or a Yorkshire, so therefore we need to plan how we're going to maintain communities and then how we're going to maintain the social fabric of those communities, especially within regions, as we move forward. So what we've done is for our product, we chose a um, battery storage company from the US called ESS Incorporated. Um, you'll be able to find them there listed on the New York Stock Exchange, ticker GWH. They listed um, earlier in um, the first week in October. It's an iron flow battery. The advantage of the iron flow battery is quite simple, easy to use. Flow batteries have been around for a long time. And people say, well, why haven't they been put in the grid? Because the need hasn't been there and the changes in capital requirements and environmental requirements haven't been there. The advantage of these for Australia is that they can operate um, at high temperatures. In fact, as you can see, 50 degrees is its, 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 its ideal. They can be stored, st charged, di discharged, and extend for period, long periods of time. So, Vantage, this supports log, log, load shifting, dispatching over longer durations for the 25 to 40 year lifetime. No fire risk, as we found out with some of these um, other batteries, but it is another, it, for us, it's one of those technologies that can support the grid. We're able to place this in remote and hospitable um, conditions, and we're talking with some large um, transmission providers, uh, generators, and also mining companies to support them. Um, the advantage of this one also is its cost is quite low in comparison to other um, comparative technologies. A little bit about the um, technology, it's effectively iron, salt and water. Um, the, um, we, we work with um, Blue Scope, with um, ferrous chloride, um, which is an offtake from their colour bond um, steel manufacturer. Um, water, potassium, sodium, and we have effectively a little bit of boric acid. We have the, um, we have the, um, we have the electrolyte. Internally, it's quite simple. Um, I liken the, apart from the flow stacks where the um, the major heartbeat occurs, the rest of the rest of the battery effectively we can. Um, some say you can buy from Bunnings. In the US, they say Home Depot, which is advantageous, um, because what it's enabled us to do is put together a, a, a process which enables us to purchase these and um, assemble these in region. A little bit on the products. This is the energy center, which is going to be our main product. These are, as you can see, the little blue uh, bits are the flow stacks. Those are stacked together in large powertrains, 40 foot containers, movable by truck or by train, and then large scale um, tanks. Where um, it's um, quite interesting because the one thing that we have, especially in central Queensland, is a very good understanding of the movement of liquids, uh, through the, especially through the um, cold processing technologies. So, so we're actually partnered up with Sedgman, the uh, mineral processing company, and they're supporting us to um, design this. So we're leveraging off 
system skills within um, Queensland surrounding mining and engineering and minerals processing. Um, and that's that's quite good because what we can do is a lot of our a lot of our products will be placed out at um, coal-fired plough stations. So it enables us to provide longer-term jobs. Um, this is not the type of product that you build and walk away from. This this requires ongoing maintenance and staffing requirements. Um, these batteries can uh, from about three megawatt up to a gigawatt, and they provide. It says up to sixteen hours but realistically it's 10 hours of storage, maybe 12 at a push. Okay. So a bit of a view, um, this is from the, from the US, low acquisition costs, we have a low cost per kilowatt hour, O&M is reasonably low. They have a bankable warranty, that is the performance is guaranteed for 20 years by Munich Re. It's performance, which is ideal for us here in Australia, wide operating temperature, it's a passive electrolyte, so therefore, in the US, they throw it down the sewer, which I wouldn't recommend, but um, it is quite inert. And then also no air conditioning, no HVAC requirements. Um, Safety-wise, non-flammable, non-toxic chemistry, it's durable, no cycling limits, no capacity fade, no performance lag. They say the most sustainable battery, I tend to agree with that, but I'm sure there's other options as well. So this comes to a most important part for what the way we learn. When we approached this, we looked at how can we ensure, and this was pre-COVID and our supply chain issues, we look at how can we build these batteries within Australia to ensure supply. Now, these batteries were originally um, funded by um, the US Department of Energy and Department of Defense. So therefore, they're very, very strong on IP controls. And there's certain nations that they will or won't work with. Um, and the advantage that we have in Australia is we have a strong rule of law. What we're aiming is the, the electrolyte purification and the flow stacks will come from the US with an aim within the next year or two to ramp up um, the manufacture of those. However, initially, the tanks, steelworks, shipping containers, electrical systems, etc., we are looking to procure locally. Just to give you an idea, that's about 75% of the balance of plant. We will then assemble here in Australia, commission here in Australia, and um, deliver those batteries. So what it is, is that it's, 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 a, it's a local manufacturing um, capability. We, the ESS battery manufacturer, we have assembly factories that we're planning initially to have one in, in Maryborough, and um, then moving up to Townsville thereafter. The aim for Maryborough is to provide large scale uh, batteries products to our um, transmission and generation clients, both in Southern Queensland and um, New South Wales and Victoria. And then uh, the aim of Townsville is to provide smaller containerized solutions to mining, remote, and also for export to the Pacific. Um, that creates direct assembly trade jobs, but also create the indirect um, jobs with the installation and movement. Um, the energy centre will EPC via a Sedgman, so we, we are directly employing people that are working within the um, within the mining industry. Now, as you can see, the battery applications, remote, island, grid, um, they have a military version of this, um, which we're not offering yet, but we will be moving towards that. Renewable firming, which is very, very important, and the um, Federal Energy Minister talks a lot about the requirement for storage and firming. Uh, grid stabilisation and then daytime solar soak. So by solar soak, I mean the energy that's um, exported from the houses through the distribution grid, that's soaked up and then piped back into the houses for the evening. So what it's doing is creating a more balanced, balanced grid. Benefits to Queensland, um, we, we did a series of modelling with um, Ernst & Young. Um, 500 regional jobs, both in the manufacturing, but also in the, um, the assembly and O&M work ongoing. It's about 4.5 billion net present value to Queensland. Type of staff that we're gonna be needing and be putting into that assembly staff, so factory hands, three level, 
mechanical electrical engineers procurement accounts. We are going to have um, our whole accounts procurement teams in region so that they're closer to the factories and working. Metal fabrication, so third parties, metal fabrication, piping, cable, electronic components. Um, and then obviously that ongoing regional maintenance position for large scale installations. Our initial output is 20 megawatts of storage per month delivered um, by Q4 23, building up to about 480 megawatts per year by Q4, Q2 2025. Um, just so you know, you can see that the, the scale of these requirements, at full capacity, we will provide only 3% of the yearly requirement by 2040. Um, we plan to expand those to work through the Pacific and also New Zealand. So we're exporting Australian um, technology or design, um, develop technology to the world. So key to our whole business case have been our procurement policy. Again, sustainability. I look at sustainability from along from environmental, economic and social. Environmental sustainability, obviously this has been the focus. You've got COP26, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of fluff, bluster going on and things like that. There's a lot of truths, half truths and left, right and centre. Market, basically increasing the market is expecting products to be sourced from renewable sources. Um, that also products that mitigate environmental impact. Um, that means sourcing timber that can be, um, timber that um, is from a renewable source, it's not, it's plantation based, that means renewable sources products and what they're using is um, technologies to track the, um, the actual inputs, the carbon inputs um, and the ethical use. So there's also, we're having to deal with, work with anti-slavery um, conditions and things like that. So the thing is though, there seems to be a real hard push for something to happen overnight. In the electricity industry and in most industries, this, this doesn't happen overnight. This is going to take a little bit of time to work through. And I, I, I generally believe that here in Australia, we're, we are doing a very good job at it. Um, and some may or may not agree, agree with that, but I think generally compared to some of the other countries that I've lived and worked in, uh, we are doing well. I think business is moving and taking it faster. I think a lot of business will move, and a lot of that is at least is due to access to markets. Um, we're seeing an increase in shareholder activism, which is going to push that. However, one of the biggest issues is, is um, greenwashing and people claiming lots of things, but the reality is not. But either way, economic sustainability focus isn't going away. But this is not everything. I, I think it's also too focused on the environment um, in a way. Environmental sustainability needs to be balanced with economic sustainability. When we're looking at investments, we still need to be able to make money. We still need to be able to put out a product that meets market needs. So for what we need to this to happen, we need pricing, pricing expectations need to be sustained. We need to be competitive in the world. And I don't necessarily mean that we have to be the cheapest, but I think we need to focus more about developing capability and technology to support not only our, all, our, all our exports, be that agricultural, mining, and manufacturing outputs. We also need to require uh, manage supply chain risk. Supply chain risk is an economic sustainability issue. If we can't bring in product into the country, if we can't develop it ourselves, as we found out with COVID, if we have a wholesale shutdown, then the just-in-time economy doesn't work. Um, we've got containers, basic got containers going for $22,000 at the moment in, um, in Asia. So the whole view, so therefore, there's a, there's a large opportunity for us to, to become more sustainable. I, I see that within energy exports, I see that within agriculture, and then also most important for us within um, manufacturing. But to maintain that, we also need to have that social sustainability. We can't continue to move away from supporting people's jobs. If there is going to be a transition, like I said before, 
we need to make sure there's a transition into jobs, into positions. So from our focus, when we look into an investment, we always want to look at how we can purchase local. So we want to support the development of local supply and the Department of State Development have been very helpful with that um, from Queensland. And we want to work with our, with our suppliers. But we're going through a supply chain analysis um, tomorrow, the session, to work through, um, working through all the different suppliers up and down the grid, up and down the coast. We also want to support the, the educational development, uh, fund edu regional education to develop capability. We believe that the future is within the younger people and we do need to see greater capability development within regions. A lot of the big capital schools have the resources. We need to make sure we continue to develop the capability within regions, support them, be that within trades, be that in universities, but also by buying local, providing them the opportunities. But also I think we need to build off existing capability. There's a lot of talk about building clusters and different clusters, and I think we need to recognise that the tremendous skill base in this state that comes from mining and engineering that can be provided to manufacturing. Mining has provided us best practice outputs. It has some of the better engineers. Like I said, I don't think people would expect a minerals processing, especially a company focusing on coal processing, to be helping design the new generation of um, storage technologies. So therefore, looking at ways to leverage our existing skills, and I, I can see that happening within um, robotics, supporting with agriculture and automation, which a lot of that's come out of um, Rio Tinto's mining automation, automation development with QUT, right through to the um, knowledge built from um, from gas movements and things like that to the hydrogen sector. I think, so therefore, instead of, instead of trying to see it as a marginal, I see, I think we need to place this, those skills front and center and how, and look at how we can better leverage those and ensure that those jobs stay within, within region. So in general, our view as investors, but also within our company, within our uh, major investment, which is ESS Asia Pacific, we are looking, we are developing regional manufacturing, and you'll see announcements of that shortly. We are focusing on localised procurement to develop greater self-sufficiency. It's good business. We want to keep those jobs in region because there's those skills there. We don't want to see people lose jobs and then move away. We want them to stay within within the communities and stay within region. And we also then want to move towards exporting value-added physical products, moving towards exporting the knowledge and the skills that we know that we have for this um, business. So um, I hope you found that um, interesting. It's a bit of a bit of an overview. If anyone else wants further information, I'm more than happy to entertain it. I'm not too sure if we can have question and answers on, on in this format, but um, thanks very much for listening. Lock on. Hello, Lachlan.
consumer and we sit at the end taking electricity supply. And so it's always been. The network was designed to cater for energy flow. As I said, from left to right, that's the traditional direction of the predominant energy flows. At the moment, we're experiencing some transitional growing pains and direction is going both ways uh, with predominant energy flows, which is causing its own set of headaches. But on the left of this particular diagram, you're seeing the, the traditional transmission network all the way down through to the end consumer, which are the small nodes at the very end with their own generation. That's what's sending energy back through those flows through the network back up, up the line. And in the future, it's possible that the direction is actually going to be quite reversed and that predominant energy flows will go from consumers or what we call you know, energy prosumers now, back up the line. And, um, and there's no problem with that. Networks would have you believe that that's a big issue. Um, really, at the end of the day, um, the network was designed to flow from one end to the other. It's the transition that is happening now with the switch of flow that's causing the issues for the network. And as we enter, you know, none of, none of this is, um, I guess, simple. And with this transition, a new paradigm is emerging and with it some new, technology, uh, new terminology that we all need to start to become more familiar with. Um, some new terms to understand are things like behind the meter or in the industry, BTM, which is anything that a consumer's site um, is connected to the grid and includes all plant and equipment and distributed energy resources, which is the next one, or DER, which is any controllable load or generation behind the meter and often refers to things like demand response, on-site generation like solar and wind and battery storage devices. Distributed energy resources management, or DERM, is also in the mix, which is the management of um, those DER um, assets. Virtual power plants, which we'll talk a little bit more today about, which is the collection of small generators, usually behind the meter, that is aggregated and forms a larger portfolio that's traded directly into the market. Power purchase agreements, so these are energy contracts direct from a generator, more often from renewable generators to retailers or consumers. And the microgrid versus the embedded network. So these concepts, the microgrid is pretty much just the same as a grid, um, just smaller. But the embedded network is a series of small connection points behind a larger one. So think shopping centre or apartment blocks, they're embedded networks. So all of those new terms are sort of coming to bear in this new space because we've got a really complex system. None of, none of the energy um, market that we've established for ourselves, be it physical or the, or the financial markets that support the energy markets are simple. Um, along with that physical construct, we've created a very difficult trading environment um, where energy traders have practiced the dark art of hedging, uh, forecasting and predicting loads and purchasing energy um, from generators. And they've done this um, in a way to obviously maximise profits for the business that they're working for. So, welcome to the new age of virtual power plants and the consumer starting to take back some of that power. So virtual power plants are basically a cloud-based technology uh, that through the evolution of sensors and IoT, virtual power plants are now integrating with our electrici electricity generation and metering and providing the opportunity for customers to participate in that complex energy market. Virtual power plants are typically, as I said, cloud-based. Um, there's definitely opportunities to monetize through market participators like retailers or energy aggregators. And I'm currently working for a retailer now that's encouraging customers to take up solar and battery and then rewarding them for allowing access to trading those batteries into the market and also having physical hedges for the retailer to use in the market and the ability to manage the value stacks and access multiple sources of value. And I'll pause on that one for a second because this is really important when you've got nascent um, technology and things that are, are starting to become valuable but maybe don't make commercial feasibility um, stack up at the moment. So batteries, for example, we know are expensive. Storage is expensive. Um, however, if you can actually gain from storage the value from the energy market, the value from reducing your own demand reduction, um, the retailer might pay you for some access, you're starting to stack up all of the pieces that make the payback of that uh, purchase of that battery uh, more feasible. 
virtual power plants can really connect to, to any of these sort of devices um, that you see, electric vehicle charging and electric vehicles themselves, HVAC energy systems, um, generation, it's all possible there. And the example I want to provide with you for multi-site customers with distributed energy resources is one particular customer. So if you have a think about maybe in this example, uh, a Woolworths supermarket. Um, Woolworths are a huge corporate. They have many, many locations, many sites. Um, they may have the ability at one site to put a whole lot of solar and on their roof and some battery storage where they have space, but on another site, they don't have the room for it. In a virtual power plant environment, Woolworths or Coles can set up their own portfolio of sites and with the assistance of a market participant like a retailer or an aggregator, they can share that portfolio of renewable generation. That's already possible today. You can have organisation-wide energy management capability through a virtual power plant. You do need to partner with the right retailer or market participant to do it, uh, but it is possible. And so in, in the Bundaberg regions example, and I did many, uh, many, many days um, and weeks here in the region when I was working with Ergon Energy Retail, working with agricultural customers and some of the challenges that they had around energy supply. And some of them are physical challenges and some of them are cost and, and tariff related. Uh, however, most of them had one, more than one connection. They had the ability to put some kind of generation, be that solar, or even um, diesel at one location, and the need to share that generation with other points on their farms. And this kind of technology can start to build those portfolios that allow for that localised sharing of energy generation. And so it is um, in that cloud-based sense and digital technologies that virtual power plants are becoming a little bit like dare I say, the Uber or the Airbnb <laughs> of the energy space, because it's a digital technology. It actually has the capacity to disaggregate and modularise industries again and allow customers to do their own generation and keep that generation local in portfolios. And so I'm sure you're familiar, and I don't need to go into the details of how Uber has disrupted uh, the taxi industry or how Airbnb has disrupted through digital technology and enablement the, um, the accommodation sector. And, and Amazon, similarly, with online shopping um, and bookstores. So if we think about it in those types of terms and what virtual power plants give us digitally, and then the ability to partner with market participants, all of a sudden, we've, we've got a real disruptor in terms of how we think about energy. And uh, this is already happening in terms of creating communities. So if you think about the scale that you can achieve with one customer's portfolio, sharing renewable resources amongst a particular set of properties. They don't even have to be co-located. They can be in different locations. Um, then it's not too much of a stretch to think that you could do this in a community. And you could actually take virtual power plants to the next level and change the way that, that people in a community actually purchase and share power. Um, Anova Energy in Northern New South Wales are already started with this concept. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not a new thing, it's not something that's coming soon, this is available today. Again, it's about creating that ecosystem that benefits the whole community, feeding in generation, allowing trading within the community um, and sharing those um, resources so that we can actually accelerate that transition into more renewable energy supply. That's all I had for you today with regards to virtual power plants. I'm here um, for the rest of the afternoon and I'm really happy to talk to you about any of these concepts. Energy Market Matters Australia is a, um, is a community of consultants. We actually all work in other areas and day jobs, but we love working together on uh, issues that matter, particularly around decarbonisation um, and supporting large corporates and governments in um, establishing their ESG targets and writing their strategies to, to go to carbon neutral and net zero with their energy supply. So if I can be of any service to you at all during the course of the day, please um, do come and speak to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heidi. I'd like to welcome Fiona and Rowan back up to join Heidi in the panel.
Um, I'm obviously not Ben Artup unless he's lost a couple of feet in height. Um, so I'll be um, facilitating the panel this afternoon. I'm Emily Murray. Um, firstly, though, we will soon release a series of investment attraction videos promoting hydrogen and the biohub. We've just got an early few snippets of this work by Council and Utilitas. We believe hydrogen could be a very big opportunity for our region. According to the World Energy Agency, Australia could be the largest producer of hydrogen in the next 30 years. So it's about how Bundaberg plays a role in that broader opportunity. Experts also agree that the way to do that and build a hydrogen economy is through biohubs that, are, that we're standing at here today. So the reason Utilitas Group picked Bundaberg as our number one project out of our target 100 projects around Australia is because of the ability to scale in this location for export. So not just to be able to produce biogas and biohydrogen for local industry, but to also be able to create sufficient critical mass to scale for export. The other advantages of Bundaberg, beyond it being a uh, biomass or agricultural horticultural powerhouse is the fact that it has a deep water port so it has export access to the ocean. It has a rail network so it has access to the rail network in and out. It has a gas network so it has access to the gas in and out. So essentially it is a logistics and infrastructure hub and that's why Bundaberg Biohub is number one. Hydrogen presents several benefits for our region. Uh, firstly, it'll create jobs. It'll help us diversify and specialise our economy into renewable energy production. Uh, secondly, it'll help us remain competitive as the world transitions to a decarbonised economy. And I guess finally, it'll help Bundaberg play a key role in meeting various state, national and global targets around renewable energy uh, and climate change targets. So I will just give the Slido platform another plug because that's how we're taking the questions today. So it's just www.slido.com um, and the code is hashtag Bundy with a capital B, bio with a capital B, 2021. So if you can just either submit your questions through there or I guess put your hand up and Kate's walking around with a roving mic. Um, so we actually do have quite a few questions ready for you guys. So to Rowan. How has Macadamias Australia gained baseline data regarding emissions to understand how the company can make the necessary reductions to reach net zero? Let's start with an easy one. Um, do I stand? I guess. Stand seated. Um, yeah, so we engaged, we're still sort of uh, looking at this whole industry. Um, there's obviously the carbon trading side of it. There is the just from a marketing side of it. So, you know, if we if we can show that we're carbon neutral or hopefully a little bit carbon negative, that's uh, already a strong um, market message that we, we would like to put forward. Um, and so we've engaged with Carbon Friendly. Um, they are a company that audits and then also gives you a, a certified authenticated logo that you pop you can pop on your website or on your products or on your bags and essentially gives you a kgs of co2 equivalent that you produce per kg of a ton of co2 produced per kg of product so for us that was a kind of a nice entry point um, in the audit process <coughs> the audit process is is not complicated when it comes to pulling all the uh, uh, the data together i think the complications come where you don't have the data, and um, we're very fortunate. I, uh, I do a little bit of the data analysis for Macadamia's Australia, and we have got an exceptional data set. So we've got up to 10 years worth of yield data, soils, soil samples, leaf samples. So all of that kind of, uh, and par part of you know fuel use, electricity use, chemical use, um, and all of that was sort of easily transferred to the audit uh, organization and then 
they give you back the feedback. Uh, they give you feedback as to where your where your um, sort of carbon outputs are. I think that's sort of roughly. Um, what is interesting is certain inputs. Lastly, like um, for example, gypsum. I wouldn't have expected, but gypsum has got a massive CO2 footprint, um, and and that helps you irrespective of what the audit says, just to be able to say, okay, I understand where we sit within the sort of CO2 footprint space and to be able to say, okay, well, how do we adjust our management practices? And I think that's probably the biggest success in the process so far. Um, and then in the trading part of that, I think we're gonna just, we're going to look and see how the, the carbon trading space uh, moves. I think it's a little bit of a hype at the, mo at the moment. And there's probably, I, I don't know if it's the right word, a bubble. So we just want to watch how that sort of all, where the skittles fall. Um, but we definitely need to be aware of how to go forward with that. I hope that answered questions. We've got a good one here from Jack Milbank. In our pursuit of EVs, are we at risk of shifting away from a reliance from coal or combustion engines to a reliance on lithium and causing a different problem? Not sure if maybe Fiona or Heidi want to take that. I'm certainly uh, not a lithium expert, um, but what I would say and comment to that is that the electric electrification of everything is on the way. And, and so lithium plays a role in, in the shift that we're going to take from combustion engine into the electric drive um, side of things, and, and lithium will be part of that. There is also a move with um, a foot with hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cell, of course, to play a role and, and for storage and hydrogen to work together. Uh, there are some innovative companies um, out of Germany that are, that are looking at that very opportunity, especially in the heavy, heavy bulk haulage space. Um, and so it's the electrification of everything, um, whether, whether that be large farm equipment or uh, mobility, like large transport trucks, trains um, and heavy haulage that's going to um, be something to watch in terms of creating a problem for ourselves. Um, if you can imagine what uh, the, the level of generation that's required to feed the national electricity market now and times that by at least three or four times in the next 20 years, um, that's the kind of scale that I've heard being discussed and I don't have the exact numbers but happy to get them to share with the group because that's the challenge, the real challenge that we see. We think we're transitioning to net zero from a base of today's generation of dirty coal um, but times that with the electrification of things by three and then start to talk about how we do the green transition and it's, it's a big, it's going to become a bigger issue. Um, I think we shouldn't also forget that um, gas and chemicals, there will be, there's also chemicals that have a significant carbon footprint, fertilisers and other things. As we, as we look at transitioning those things, they're equally as important to get to net zero. Um, Recognising, Jack, that that's your background as well, to transition away from um, chemical fertilisers into equally productive biological or hybrid-based um, um, fertilisers and nutrient and um, pest management systems. So I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple process. And yes, we will electrify a lot, but very big, heavy industrial processes may um, not be able to be electrified and, and will still require gas and, and hydrogen, of course, 97% of the hydrogen that's used in the economy today is actually not used for mobility, it's used for chemical processes and as part of um, electricity production and all those kinds of things. So the transition, I think, is a lot deeper and more nuanced and complex than a lot of people think. I don't think it's, um, it, it's not one size fits all, it's not one solution. We'll see a general trend to electrification of things that are easy to move and tip about, but there's other stuff and there's chemical processes and productions. If you start drilling in to what is currently derived from fossil petrochemicals, um, you actually find that a hell of a lot of stuff is. And so to move to a net, uh, a, a net zero world is a, is a massive shift and a massive opportunity. Thanks, Fiona. There's quite a few targeted questions here for um, specific speakers, but I'll throw this one in. Um, transition to clean energy may require a smaller number of highly skilled jobs compared to non-renewable supply chains. 
how does Australia effectively make the transition? I think uh, to start with, our speaker um, Stuart Perry in the battery and energy storage space really hit a nerve with me um, in, t in terms of repurposing the ama amazing skills that we have within the industry sectors that we have grown from, from the ground up um, in mining and engineering. Uh, there's enormous transferable skill uh, that could put their brains to this problem. Yeah, I think when it comes to jobs, it's... Um it's very easy to divide and conquer and make it sound like there's going to be winners and losers and the world has become a bit like that as ground zero winners and losers. Actually, the thing that I think is most exciting about this transition um, is because it's grounded in the regions, A, and B, because it, it actually spans traditional jobs, existing jobs and new jobs. I don't. It's, it's not an either or, it's not a win-loss. I think anyone who... Anyone who plays the bat and hits the ball like as if it's black and white and it's win-lose and it's, you know, somebody's missing out is actually just playing for their own political gain. They're not playing for... Um, they're not leading. And, I mean, you saw Jack here today. He's a real leader and he's, he's about everybody winning out of this transition. And I think that's what real leadership is. And I think we don't see that on the 9 o'clock seven o'clock news very often we we see that when you come out to places like this today that it, it really is about making sure we energize local communities that it, it isn't about leaving people behind it isn't also about scaring the crap out of people so they feel like you know they feel fearful of stuff why would you want to commute create a community where people are afraid this is a place for opportunity you know it's it's really a place for opportunity I did actually, our Kate, our environmental engineer, graduated from Griffith University with her PhD a few months ago and when we were at her graduation, the young girl who was the, I guess, valedictorian, you might call it in America, I don't know what we call it in Australia, but she spoke on behalf of her cohort of graduates and fantastic speech I thought she gave because she said, don't think that all the things that need to be discovered have been discovered. We are, haven't even tipped the iceberg of these discoveries. And, you know, that, that's the opportunity from this. This is the fantastic thing that we face now. We're going to uncharted territory because not only can we, you know, fly a space shuttle to another planet, but we can actually drill into subatomic particles and do stuff that I don't understand. But do you know what I mean? Like, this is a whole journey. And I think anyone who plays it to divide and conquer is an idiot. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to sort of add, uh, you know, in terms of jobs and, and I think they're multi... Uh, we all probably have five or six uh, stages in our lives where we pivot into different sort of uh, specialisations and with access to internet and the access to information. Um, what you find is that, you know, if you look at Kevin, for example, who is one of the siblings that's running Macadamia's Australia, he went from a tomato farmer and pivoted into a macadamia farmer and is now probably pivoting into a sustainable um, business entrepreneur, you know. And, and those things, I mean, it's it's created a whole nother job title, but it's incrementally he's learnt into that. So I think the idea of being able to pivot and learn from one job into the next is not impossible. It's just you eat the elephant one bite at a time. Uh, that's one thing that comes up in conversations quite regularly, um, especially with my new, new role at HQ, which I've really only been there for about four or five weeks, um, but it comes up quite regularly, and that is the shift in thinking that is going on, that's going on with the transition. And, e and everybody's perspective on how to do this and how we, how we will win is so different to what it was. Um, it's not egocentric. It's the, the language is around collaboration. It's about working together. Do we know how and will we do it perfectly? No. Um, but we are out there giving it a go. And, and the cultural shift that that, that is making 
um, is just enormous and, and it's having it's making real traction certainly within within HQQ and, and the networks that in the ecosystem that we have um, you know at HQQ. And something interesting that I heard a couple of weeks ago, um, I think it was actually on Q&A, was the word transition sort of infers that we are leaving part of the community behind to move on to a different part of the community. Um, and it was suggested that we use the word transformation. So I thought that was really interesting to note. Um, this one's a popular one. To Heidi, are there any examples of a community working together to deploy a virtual power plant for a significant energy consumer, for example, local government or major business? I can't think of a, a single case study that has actually gone and done this and is reporting back, but, uh, but ARENA have a number of pilots on virtual power plants that they are reporting on quite regularly. That, that pilot hasn't finished. Um, that continues to go through. So I definitely, whoever, who asked that question? That was an anonymous one, that's okay. Um, have a look on the ARENA website. You only have to Google VPP. There's many um, different um, pieces of information there. Um, there are, however, um, in the VPP space, I know a number of the developers of the software platforms and, um, and they have some case studies. One that was interesting to me that, that seemed quite relevant um, for today um, is certainly the use of a virtual power plant within um, a community of dairy farmers in New Zealand. So that case study hasn't been published on their website, but I'm hassling them <laughs> for that so that we can sort of see how that's been actually um, utilised to, to yeah, transition onto renewables and sharing of energy um, in a real commercial case. So noting it's about 20 minutes until the Melbourne Cup, um, I'll just finish with one last question. Um, yet another easy one. Um, so to the panel, how do we transition to net zero and maintain that energy capacity, particularly with a focus on manufacturing? I'll go first. <laughs> oh, look, I, I think we need to bring to bear um, all the tools in the, in the toolbox. So I think that's probably the, the key message. Oh, sorry. I think that's the key message that this there isn't there isn't some kind of silver bullet that's going to shoot down the road and suddenly we're going to be shifted. Um, and I do think it takes um, it, it it is actually going to take parties to to hold hands with each other and step through some uncharted waters, like we did with the council. And you know, I I, I think I think they're important examples of showing what can be done and and just trust. I think we, we have a community that's kind of been a bit eroded of trust in more recent, let's just say, decades. And I think maybe that's something COVID might have just reset the dial on. I think it's reset the dial on localization. I think it's reset the dial on people going, wait on a second, this is just crap, we should be doing something different. I think it's, um, it's given us a view of our um, food supply chain in Australia and how awesome it is. But if you look at the other side of that coin, we import 97% of our liquid fuel and our chemical fertilisers on which that, fuels, that food supply chain depends. So it, it is a very awesome supply chain. It is extraordinarily vulnerable. In fixing that vulnerability, we actually fix um, moving towards net zero. So I think they're the kinds of dots that are joining for people now. And so I think where we see leadership that's gonna, that is emerging at all kinds of levels, I think industry in Australia has been stepping up for quite some time now. And I think we saw it um, during the debates about gay marriage and other things when it was quite politically dangerous for some people to stand up and, and um, show their true colours. And I think we saw that people are even willing to do that today and, and I think that is the next generation of leadership in industry that is now really coming through and basically being accept, expected that you lead like that, that you are authentic, that you do actually express who you are and what, what you are and that your business that you are the steward of for this moment in time actually lives those values and I think that's what's changing and I think that is the shift that is actually going to allow us to 
eat this chocolate elephant from the big toenail up. <laughs> How do you follow that? Uh, a chocolate elephant sounds great. <laughs> is it lunchtime? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so uh, what I would add is that uh, there's, there absolutely has been a shift. The transition, I, I couldn't be more delighted that, that industry is leading the conversation at a global, on a global scale. Um, investors are, are saying they're only going to put their money um, where they can see a transition already on, on the move or a transformation already underway. Uh, that is a really great start. Our governments will catch up um, eventually. And, um, and, and what I'm also seeing, um, to the credit of Bundaberg Regional Council and others, is our local governments really leading the way. Um, and, and that localised energy um, is really going to be the thing that, um, that lifts lifts the tide. Um, just just a, an interesting perspective was when when uh, you start working, so from an academic background, you start working in the commercial space and you actually start realising that um, once you have uh, companies that are receptive to what is required, there's actually a lot of low-hanging fruit and it's all, all you need to do is just say, okay, well, what do we need to learn in order to achieve a target like net zero or you know, whatever the case may be? And, and once you start just getting into a very sort of general um, level of understanding, suddenly you're like, oh, that was really quite easy to knock out a huge CO2 emitting practice or you know, um, limit a certain management or, or change a certain management practice and and in that process it doesn't take rocket science and the, and the academics have known it for many many years it's just the, the frustration of the academic doesn't know how to get that information into the public space and then the public space doesn't really either even know that that forest exists um, but w when there's the receptiveness and the sort of engaging with the information suddenly half the battle is won you know already just by access to to the information and I think that's that's something that's quite easy to do without having to to change a lot please join me in thanking our panel members and can we please thank our facilitator Emily <laughs> who has been amazing coordinating this conference along with Kate can we please give them both a round of applause they've done a huge amount of work to make this happen. So, who feels like some lunch? I think you've earned it by now. So, uh, if you want to go out and uh, hopefully lunch is ready out there now, um, and of course the trade display, if you'd like to come back in with your lunch, we're actually showing the race that stops the nation at two o'clock. If you've got your sweet tickets handy, please bring those with you. We can't guarantee there's a chocolate elephant in the packs but there is chocolate um, provided by um, Cha Cha Chocolate. Those who are local know how fantastic it is. Those who aren't, uh, you've got to experience while you're here. It's an absolutely magical chocolate shop in Bourbon Street and they've provided three beautiful hampers as prizes for our sweeps today. So please bring those in, um, bring your uh, lunch back in. The bus to the Bio Hub, Hub site visit will leave at 2.45. So please be ready to go at that time. So go and grab some lunch, have a quick look at the trade displays, come back in for two and we'll uh, see who's going to be the winners. Thank you.